from the Disaster Management Board. Can they raise their hands? I saw one or two. I'm sure I saw one or two. Lebo is one of them, and Penny is one of them. Thank you very much. Can we give them a hand? <laughs> These are people who would intervene during uh, disasters. Uh, oh, they were low, sorry. Can they raise their hands again? There we go. Thank you. Wonderful. This review was essential, Minister, to inform deliberations on closing the gap in the social assistance program for children, especially in the country with an estimated 7 million children living below the food poverty line, many of, the, many of which are CSG uh, beneficiaries, and a quarter of children under five in this country being stunted. Statistics tell us that around 62.1% of South African children experience multi-dimensional levels of poverty. That's poverty at a range of levels. And that makes it even more complex um, to raise children. You would recall, Minister, that during the 2020 lockdown, you publicly referred to the need to review the value of the child support grant in relation to the food poverty line. And I think this review is going to give us some solutions towards that end and help us take some of these measures forward. I said in the other room that there are two people who are missing, two groups of people who are missing in this room. One is the National Treasury because the findings and the recommendations that come out of this report essentially have to be worked through the holders of the fiscus and that's the National Treasury. Nonetheless, we are nice people. We will share the report with them and debate later. Um, the other group of people who I feel are significantly missing in the room, um, but I'll explain to you how we'll rectify that shortly, are children themselves because this piece of work is about children. So if you're under the age of 35, if you could raise your hand, if you're under 35, I think we have a sizable representation of children now, Minister. Thank you very much. You are considered a child in, in, this, in, in this slide. So without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, um, mine is to then ask you to put your hands together and welcome Mr. Vernie Harris, the acting CEO of the National Mandela Foundation, who will give you a welcome uh, remarks and a message of support. Thank you, sir. No, thanks very much. Uh, morning, everybody. Dumula. Uh, I'm acting in the same way that he's acting, but he's got that Hollywood touch. I don't have that touch. And uh, I can promise you my, my, my speech is very short, <laughs> unlike his. Um, let me just say a few things. Uh, it's it's real pleasure to have the Department of Social Development back. We've done a lot of work with them over the years. Um, it's, it's very good to have so many government officials in this space. And I've worked in this organization for 20 years. I think in the last 18 months, I've seen more government officials here than ever before. And that tells me that we're beginning to see how civil society is working closely with the state. Uh, we're also able to harness the private sector. They're also a, an important player here in order to address intractable problems. And I think the problem that this particular report is addressing is one of the most intractable of all. We got involved in early childhood development back in 2018, and that was the result of uh, a report also based at UCT, the Mandela in uh, Initiative for Poverty and Inequality, which identified early childhood development as one of the potential game changers in dismantling intergenerational poverty and inequity. We feel more strongly about it than ever before. Back in 2018, I think the statistic was the same, a quarter of our five, six-year-olds suffering from stunting. And more and more, the work that we do at the foundation, whether it's in food security, whether it's in land, ECD, it's centered on ensuring that our six-year-olds have a shot at life. And to have a proper shot at life, they have to have food, good nutrition. They have to have security, protected from domestic violence, other forms of violence. And they need to have had some educational programming. So we want to be part of finding solutions to, to that challenge. And all of you who are here today, I believe, have an interest in that objective. I just happened to be reading a book last week. It's called Brainscapes, and I want to recommend this book to you. This is by a neuroscientist who 
explores the ways in which the experiences of our babas, starting in the womb, even in the womb, their experiences of atmospheres, of nutrition, uh, of of attitudes, of voices, and so on, affects the brain mapping, which determines how they will see the world for the rest of their lives. We've got to find ways of protecting our babas and ensuring that they thrive. Let me just say, I read this book. I call it a book because it's as big as a book. Uh, I read it yesterday, finished it last night. I didn't sleep very well. It's, it's not an easy report to read but I think it's an important one. It's a reminder of what we're faced by. Uh, so thank you to those of you who did the research and the writing, and thank you to everybody uh, whose and the names are all there, may make it possible. What we now have to make sure is that, that this feeds into public discourse and into the public policy domain. We'll do what we can too as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can we give um, um, Vernie a hand? Um, Vani, I want to remind you of a quotation that Utata um, said many years ago. He said, and I'll tell you where I'm going with this, when we read, we are able to travel many places, meet many people, and understand the world. Vani has laid the platform for you, for every speaker that comes after this, to recommend a book when they walk off the podium. And Vernie, thank you for that recommendation. Uh, I'm going to get the book, Brainscape. It's an important book, I think, if you want to understand um, this piece of, especially some parts of this work and understanding children, essentially. Um, so I think we'll work towards that. But there is something that you said around having NGOs in the space and having a range of people here, private sector, etc., uh, which gives me a sense, essentially, that this is the building of solutions. And I hope that when we leave this building, we would have found working with the solutions and recommendations or findings rather that come from the report that we'd be able to put those solutions into practical, implement, implementable um, uh, uh, action points, if you like. So I do hope that we'd be able to do that. One more hand for Verney uh, Harris, my, uh, my, my, my colleague in Hollywood who is acting with me. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, at this point in time, I'd like to welcome to the stage Ms. Brenda Sibeko, who is the DDG for Comprehensive Social Security, to talk to you very briefly uh, around the rationale of the study. Can you put your hands together for Brenda? Good morning, Minister, again. Good morning, all our dignitaries and everyone in the room. I think you can hear me well, eh? Um, I thought in order to save time and not to freestyle, because then I'll go on for quite long, primarily because of the richness of the report. So it's better to just focus and, and actually read what I prepared, or what, what, was pre what we have prepared in order to, to deal with this part of the agenda. The, Minister, you, you, I hope you, 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 you realize that when you speak, we do listen. When in 2020 you were, you were speaking about the, the relief package, the social relief package, uh, one of the issues you did raise at that stage, because part of the relief package was to increase, the, the, to top up all the different grants, including the, the, the child support grant. You spoke to the fact that it's so important that the child support grant at least gets to the point of, to, it reaches the, value of the food poverty line because at the, as we have it, it is the lowest grant and it does not um, fully address food poverty for children. And we listened and we actually thought we had, the last time we had reviewed the, the, the child support grant was in 2010. So it was time yes that we do another study and start to review the child support grant. So part of uh, the initiation of the work was your raising the, the, the issue around the value of the child support grant being below the food poverty line. So we commissioned the work um, with, with uh, the Children's Institute and we asked them to, 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 to do certain things. So the purpose that we gave to them for the review was firstly to assess the state of, the ch of child poverty in the country, to document the policy processes in the development and expansion of the child support grant, to review the impact of the child support grant on child poverty, 
to review the value of the child support grant in the context of child poverty and the cost of raising a child, which DG has been speaking about, to assess the potential impact on child poverty of not increasing the value of the CSG, to identify options for increasing the CSG value, increase, including vulnerable groups um, that can be targeted for top-ups, to calculate the budget implications, which is of course very important, uh, of increasing the value, and then to assess each option based on the cost, impact for children, as well as the policy, legal and administrative implications. To, and, and then we also ask them to obviously, at the end of all of their analysis, to then recommend a plausible approach then to, to, to address, this, to, to address the, the child support grant and what, how it's supposed to impact on poverty. Um, so, so we are still very acutely aware of the fact that children in this country live in very poor households. A majority of parents are unemployed or earn very low incomes. And so as a country, we have a constitutional responsibility so that, that, that we ensure that there's a decent safety net pr primarily for children because they cannot support themselves. Due to the persistent structural unemployment facing the uh, people in the country, over 7.3 million children are living in households where none of the adult members are employed. This is a very big problem. 7.3 million is not, it's not a small, that, that's why uh, we really need to do something and we need to do it quickly. Um, the increased unemployment, the, the, we need to increase employment opportunities in the country. And we also need to improve the quality of jobs that people have so that they are better able to support their children. This is a very tough call. We've been at it for the past 30 years. We have, we're still struggling with it. So we need to do a lot of other work in addition to looking at the child support grant to say, how do we lift parents also out of poverty so that they're better able to look after their children? Because you don't only raise the child with income. You also raise them with other parts of the, of the social protection uh, system in the country. So the, the department currently provides two, ch two grants that are primarily for p poverty alleviation, the CSG and the COVID SRG grant. And, and we have other uh, child grants such as the, the CDG care dependency grant for children who are disabled and the foster care grant. So there are other grants that, you pro that we provide, but with regards to children, our concern is the extent to which what we are providing adequately addresses the multidimensional nature of poverty that we've heard about. Um, as a department, we <coughs> continually need to assess the strength of our safety nets and look at ways to improve their effectiveness in, re in reducing poverty. Um, so the study is one of a number of studies that we have commissioned to look at options for strengthening a social uh, assistance program. We are currently looking at various other uh, social assistance uh, reviews, such as the review of the care dependency grant, which is targeted at children who, with disabilities. We are reviewing that also, and hopefully when we finish, that we'll also be able to launch it. But for, 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 for this one, we, we are hoping that the findings that the researchers will give us are, are going to assist us in order to formulate doable policy, because that's the key thing. It must also be doable, which is why it would have been great to have treasury care. Um, but we also we think it's really important that we take note of the fact that uh, child poverty isn't only about income poverty, it's also about the other elements. So even as we, we battle for increasing the value of the child support grant and its income, we also need to make sure that other elements are also being dealt with. But for today, it's really important that we look at the child support grant. It is has been identified as the most effective grant in dealing with child poverty. So we really need to say, let's target a lot of our effort in dealing with this one and improving it and so that its impact will also be uh, enhanced. So we look forward to, re to the research uh, findings that our, our team is going to give us and we will then engage obviously with the, with, the, with the findings and the recommendations and GSD for our parts, we want to use the work in order to be able to develop uh, and improve the child support grant policy that we have in place at the moment. Thank you very much um, for the session. Thanks. Thank you, Brenda. You forgot to recommend the book because readers are leaders. Oh, and I uh, the book. yes. <coughs> there, 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 there's, a, there's, a, there's a South African woman no? who lives in the US now. She writes a lot about the brain. And she writes several books. I can recommend three books, actually. <laughs> <laughs> 
You'll save the next speakers, it's okay. Yeah. One is called Think, Learn, Succeed. Yeah. Um, I must remember her name now. I'll tell you her name. We'll but uh, yeah, it's <laughs> called Think, Think, Learn, Succeed. I'll just yeah, remember the name of Caroline somebody. I've for forgotten her same name, but I'll let you know. Thank you very much, Brenda. Can we give a hand one more time? <laughs> Think, Learn, Succeed. <clears throat> you see the, do you see, CEO, the, the brain wave that's happening around brains today? Thank you very much, Brenda, for really talking to us about the rationale of the study and reminding us. And I think there's something that is unique, that is important that you spoke about, uh, which I want to put slightly differently. Um, not different to what you said, but I want to make it impactful in this way. Do we understand or have we ever measured the implications of inaction? Are you with me? In other words, what will be the cost of not acting in addressing child poverty? That's essentially what you spoke about. So everybody puts up these walls and say, there's no money here, there's this, there's that, there's that, there's problems. We hear that, but if we measure the cost of inaction, it'll blow your mind. So that's what we need to be conscious of every time we look at this piece of work and different pieces of work. It's our argument that we always put, uh, put, uh, put forward when we engage uh, finances and treasury, by the way. Thank you very much, Brenda. Um, so, at this point in time, we're going to call upon the CEO of SASA to talk to us about the role of the DSD portfolio in poverty reduction. And Ms. Totsi Memela Kambule. Busisiwe Memela Kambule. Thank you very much. Can you put your hands together for the CEO? That way. I feel like I'm the Speaker of Parliament behind her. A very good morning. It's really an honor and privilege uh, for, for, for me to be part of this um, important launch today uh, as a mother and a mother who really didn't bring up some of her children because of what we had to do. As many of us that had to leave children behind would understand. But as DG indicated, uh, poverty is the single biggest problem that we have as a country. And it comes with unemployment and it, it comes with inequality that we continue to experience as a country. Um, and a cornerstone of government's program has been to tackle poverty. And this has been with extreme difficulty, particularly now as we face the, the economic challenges that we currently face as a country. In order to fight poverty, all South Africans should be included as full citizens through opportunities for employment, personal development, and uh, community engagement. It's, it's, it's really wonderful to again continue to have a civil society as part of the dialogue. Uh, the CEO indicated uh, in the morning uh, when we had the briefing of the minister that dialogue is not about agreeing with each other all the time. Yeah. If we do, we're having a chat. Mm -hmm. It's like we're having a WhatsApp group if we don't uh, disagree on particular things, and in some instances, it may, may be on the how. And I think as a nation, we always focus on, on the how without being visionary in terms of how do we close that gap between what it is that we're trying to do and the vision that we actually want to achieve. I think we've stopped dreaming as a country. We were wonderful dreamers. We used to be able to set our, our bars very high in terms of what it is that we wanted to achieve as a country. And I, I think we don't do that anymore. We've put our heads and just looking at problems and problems, but we're not coming with exciting and new opportunities in, them, in terms of what it is that we can do differently as a collective. Because unfortunately, where we are as a country, there's no one. Government cannot solve the problems on their own. And I think it becomes important for us to make sure that those partnerships become strengthened partnership 
through dialogue and again without necessarily agreeing with, with each other. So the broad government strategy and commitment in addre addressing poverty and the challenges that came uh, uh, before this democratic dis dispensation require, requires a, a comprehensive strat strategy to overcome the legacies of the past, but also some of the things that we could have done differently in the past 30 years. Because we, we, we also need to recognize and acknowledge that some of the things could have been done differently. But there's no point in us beating each, ourselves up. We need to just say, what then do we do? We need to reset and say, what do we do now, considering where, where we are? The key strategies, uh, therefore, include creating opportunities for all South Africans to develop to their full potential through education and training. And it continues to set in one to see what has happened in our education system. We find young children, young girls uh, getting pregnant e even at the age of 14. So even on the education space, we need to rethink and say what is it that we need to do differently. Job creation, improving conditions of employment and creating opportunities for all, of, for all our young people in particular to sustain themselves through productive activity. We all leave our homes and you find young men standing in corners uh, without being productive. That cannot be good for anybody. It can't give them a sense of purpose uh, if they are standing in co corners on a day-to-day -day basis. We currently, for example, as an institution in our SRD, a grant that we do, we have over 750,000 um, social grant beneficiaries who, are, who have applied and received 350 that actually have some kind of diploma or qualification, which really is a travesty of justice. Something is wrong in our, even our, in our job uh, uh, system that uh, allows us to let graduates be walking the streets and standing in street corners when they can contribute to the productivity of the country. Establishing a social security system and other safety nets and protect in, uh, that protect the poor, particularly the disabled, the elderly, and other vulnerable groups is a key strategy of, of government. I'm going to uh, relate to the work that uh, Mastura and, and the team actually do, which is the National Development uh, uh, Plan Objective, which committed that, that by 2030, no South African should be living below the food poverty line. It's a serious struggle. Uh, with our economic situation now, we'll continue to battle to achieve this over and above the many things that we have not been able to achieve in terms of our commitment uh, uh, that on, on things that needed to be done by uh, 2030. Our constitution in terms of section, section 27, one of C, further committed that the right to social assistance for those who are unable to support themselves and their dependents is critical. Uh, what then do we do as a portfolio within that we call ourselves the portfolio because uh, it's, it's SASA that's part of uh, one of the agencies that do the work for, for DSD. And then we have DSD with an, a number of programs, and we have NDA, and we all have uh, different responsibilities in terms of uh, what it is that we are supposed to do. As a portfolio, we contribute to reduction of income poverty by providing income support to South Africans who are not able to support themselves. Uh, there's an interesting debate on whether we should be looking at alleviating reducing or getting rid of poverty completely. And I think this is one of the other discussions that we need to have as a country. What is our vision? Because if we say our vision is just to reduce, we'll continue, because we're aiming here, because reduction is aiming here. What is it that we need to do to aim here so that even if we fall here, we know that our sites are much, much higher sites uh, for us to be able to achieve the things that we do. Social assistance and cash transfer programs have a strong impact on poverty reduction and economic growth. The social assistance program has been influential in redistributing income to the poor, reducing current poverty, increasing school participation, 
reducing child labor and improving utilization of health a serv and, and uh, uh, services uh, for mothers and children in particular. Without the contribution of social assistance, at least 40% of the population would not have any kind of income in terms of where we are as a country. Evidence from studies uh, on, on COVID-19, and we really are grateful uh, to the work that has been done by uh, at different research institutions uh, to look at what it is, uh, what impact has this uh, program have. But it showed that s social assistance and other direct cash transfers are particularly eff efficient in emergency solution, but we can't continue as a, as a country to be in an emergency state because that's where we are. We're now on perpetual and continuous emergency, and, and I think something has to give, but things will only give if we come together. We came together in the past as a country to solve the problems of our country, and I believe we can uh, 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 do that again, but we need to reset, we need to work as a collective and say who can do what and, and, and be visionary in our approach. As the uh, portfolio, we have ensured that approximately 70% of our elderly persons in South Africa continue to, to receive their old age uh, pension grant every month, though we got disappointed by the challenges that Postbank, who is our distributor, actually had in the past, in, in the current few months. And we were, were pleased to say, uh, through the work of both DGs, we've worked consistently to look at what is it that we need to do differently to make sure that the challenges that we have we had in the past month uh, should never, ever occur again. But again, what, what I think we don't communicate enough is that our people do have choices. And sometimes I think as a country, we tend to not understand that our people have choices. Once they are given choices, all we need to do is to communicate with them and tell them what the choices are, and they will make the right choice for themselves. Ensuring that people with disabilities, both adults and children, receive a dis disability a grant is also another key focus of the portfolio. We have also continuously supported the children, which I will not talk to uh, for it's just the focus for today. I will not say much about this. The other key area is reform of social security program. COVID-19, which I referred to, is a program that happened during a crisis, but it enabled us to look at things, commitments that we had made as a country long time ago to say we need to do something different about the gap of people that are between 18 and 59 that are, have been excluded. It's been an interesting learning for us in terms of that program. It's been starts and stops, but also we've really looked at what needs to be done differently. Yes, I know that there's a cry out there to say some of the people are actually sitting outside the net, but we co continue to look at what it is that we need to, to do differently. Poverty reduction is also about providing opportunities for lifelong learning and skills acquisition. We are privileged uh, to have worked with NISFAS over the past few years to make sure that if a child is a child that has been re uh, receiving a child support grant, automatically when they succeed and they're able to go to school, they don't have to uh, start from scratch in terms of application because we share the data and through that process, then they are able to get their NISFAS support. But we know that again, even with NISFAS, there's been challenges in terms of the level of funding that is, is, is required. DG said we need to not say too many words, but again, it's important to indicate that it is through strong families that we can be able to support our children and strong communities and one continue to, to be privileged to work with uh, uh, NGOs that also look at everything else over and above, just the grant, so that we can make sure that our families are strong because strong families make strong communities. Strong communities would enable us to create a, a, a better country. In the words of Dadama Diba, overcoming poverty is not a gesture of charity. It is an act of justice. It is the protection 
of a funda fundamental right, the right to dignity and a right to decent life. Thank you, TJ. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, CEO. Put your hands together for the CEO one more time. She did say that before she leaves here, she will give you that book recommendation. Thank you very much, CEO. And again, very useful information. You reminded us of a few things. One is never to stop dreaming. If you could turn to, to the person next to you and say, never stop dreaming. <coughs> and then say this to them. Then say this. Say your dream will become your reality. You can see I've been in church last night. Thank you very much. Uh, and CEO, I think the other important thing that you reminded us about, which I think is, is something crucial that we often forget, that we have a national development plan that we are working towards, which says by 2030, no South African should be living below the food poverty line. We need to remind ourselves of this. And if you count, 2030 is a mere seven years away. In other words, in seven years, CEO, we must have made sure that every single person is living above the food poverty line. That's what we planned a number of years ago. And sometimes we forget that important stuff. Uh, the one important thing I think you reminded us of, which is very significant, CEO, is the role that grants have had to play in the country as a government intervention in addressing poverty. This is, has been one of government's most strategic and successful poverty alleviation program. And I know a lot of people have a problem with that, but that's the truth. Speak to the statisticians and they'll tell you. Because of the program on grants, we've managed to significantly address some challenges around poverty. That's the truth. I was in a few countries uh, in the, on the African continent, uh, Minister, not so long ago. And one of the countries I've been to, in fact, two of them, they indicated this. They said that, well, if we don't get donor funding to pay the grants, we don't pay the grants. Let me translate that for you differently. The old age grant, the elderly in some of these places, if the donor funding doesn't come from where it comes from, because in the fiscus it's difficult for them to adjudicate the funding to pay the grants, they are not able to pay the older people the grants. What am I saying? I'm saying that you could go as an older person in some of the countries for years without receiving a grant because there's no money coming from the donors. We are fortunate in South Africa that we have a government that cares and that is able to ensure that from the grant, that, that from the fiscus, we are able to pay grants. In this country, you will never have a grant not paid because the government has decided that, even with the cu budget cuts, you'll never cut grants. It's a constitutional responsibility that we've embedded into our constitution. So a lot of people may say a lot of negative things about us. The truth of the matter is that the state has intervened effectively in trying to address some of the challenges. Have we done everything that we can? No. A lot more still needs to be done. But let's acknowledge the fact that a significant piece of work has been done by the state. Thank you very much, CEO. Um, let's give a hand one more time. <coughs> so, at this point in time, I'm going to call upon Ms. Um, Spusisiwe Sibeko, and I wonder if there's a relation with Brenda. Sibeko. Uh, oh, and uh, exactly. Um, but thank you very much, and she will talk to us. She's a finance analyst at the Parliamentary Budget Office, and she will set the scene for what is to come next. Can you put your hands together for Ms. Sibeko? Thank you. Uh, I think it's still morning or might be afternoon now. I'm not sure if, if the slides are working um, yet. But I actually wanted to share with you a quote that somebody sent this morning. Um, it was by uh, John Keynes. I don't know if anyone knows Keynes, but some people might know Keynes. But Keynes in 1942 in a BBC interview said, anything we can actually do, we can afford. 
we are immer immeasurably richer than our predecessors. It is not evident that some sophistry, some fallacy governs our collect collective action if we are forced to be so much meaner than they in the embellishments of life. So I want to start there because I think there really is this fallacy that we cannot afford to do better. Um, and if the slides aren't working, I can just start uh, with the presentation. So what I really came, hmm? should we connect, okay. So I've been told I can use the clicker. So I'm going to move through a bit of the situational analysis about where we find ourselves in South Africa, but I'm also going to talk about where we find ourselves in terms of fiscal policy as of budget 2023. And as the Parliamentary Budget Office, we've raised continuously that the notion of fiscal consolidation, or what we call austerity, is very detrimental to our country and our development. And in fact, this continued fiscal consolidation austerity will mean that we will not meet our national development plan goals. Um, and in this report, what is interesting to me is, of course, um, the arguments that, you know, we should be increasing the CSG. And so we need to ask ourselves, what does that mean in the context where there's been, there are constraints to what we can do with the budget, or supposedly the constraints that have been put forward? Um, so in terms of the situational analysis, I can't see my slides now, but to say we know there's deep, deep inequality in South Africa. Um, and so fiscal policy is a significant tool for redistribution. Oh, perfect. Okay, and I can see them here. Okay, so here we are. Large proportions of South Africa's population are subject to debilitating poverty and unemployment. And I want to f f like highlight here that is, it is actually the structure of our economy, the path dependence, the financialization, the inadequate development policies, including industrial policy that have left us where we are. So the economy is reproducing in an unequal way, right? So the fact that um, you'll see there the top 10% of South Africa have 66.5% of the income, right? And whereas, and wealth, the top 10% have 85.7% of the country's wealth. You'll see that the, the bottom 50% actually have negative wealth. What does that mean? It means when people have paid their bills, when people have dealt with their finances, they actually have negative wealth at the end of the day. And so it is the structure of the economy um, and, the, and, and not changing it that has led to this continuous um, cycle. Next slide, please. I know you can see my notes, which is <laughs> quite fascinating. Um, <laughs> can um, we put it on slideshow? I don't know who's got the laptop. But anyway, so we here, next slide, please. Or oh, I can move the slides, actually. So the, the president recently said that African women are the face of poverty, and I'd actually extend that to say children, too, right? Um, and there's an interesting book where we're doing book suggestions, and there's a book by Nancy Fulber who says, Who Pays for the Kids? It's written in 1994, and it's one of the early feminist works. And Who Pays for the Kids? And Nancy Fulber highlights how women have joined the workforce, and even though they're now getting incomes, but they're doing disproportionately more of the social reproductive work. So who pays for the kids, not just in financial terms, but in unpaid care work terms, right? So in South Africa, we know that, of course, African women uh, have lower incomes um, and also are, have higher rates of unemployment. We know that they mostly live in rural areas. Um, and, you know, in those households, the subjectively poor households are headed by black fem African females younger than 35. And earlier we raised our hands um, about who's under 35. Yeah. So people who are in that age range who live in the rural areas in particular. But also to note that Poverty increased between 2011 and 2015, but of course, post-COVID, we can imagine that these numbers are increasing further. I think we've lost the slides there. Um, can we connect the slides again? Okay, so there's, and, and South Africans are, are, have, are experiencing an ongoing, intense, long-term cost of living crisis, right? So we can't think of it as a modern day phenomenon. In fact, for, for since apartheid, right, people, the majority of the population has been experiencing a crisis of living, really, like a cost of living crisis, but not just that, the crisis of social reproduction, which means that majority of our population is unable to socially reproduce themselves. And I'm not talking about just um, the, the ability to be in the workforce, which is one of it. Labor is a part of social reproductive process, but the ability to secure our livelihoods, particularly in households. So you see the vulnerability to hunger has increased post-COVID. 
And of course, yeah, I won't go through the slide quickly, but to basically show that when you look at the average cost of a household hold food basket, it is higher than the national minimum wage. So when we think about what people can afford, we've got large proportions of working poor. So sometimes employment is posited as the solution, but what does it mean when people are working poor? They're working, but they're unable to secure their basic needs. So sometimes when you think about employment and employment policies, we have to think beyond just people in the workforce, but really what does it means, mean for their social reproduction? And then of course here we highlight in the PBO uh, a lot because we care about this, um, where children ECD sector. Um, and so you see here that education in South Africa is still determined largely by socioeconomic status. And there are large proportions of children that are staying home and not going to creches, um, even though we've got new policies that say all children must grow to grade R, right? So when we make policies and we think about access to ECD sector, it's very important that we think about who's able to access this. And you see there in, in quintal one, how many children are at home with a parent or guardian. There was an interesting study in 2000 by um, Stats SA. They haven't um, really redone this survey as I would like, but it's a time use survey and it shows that women were saying they are unable to look for jobs because they're at home taking care of children. So when we think about the opportunity cost, where do you get the money to look for a job? Do you stay at home to take care of the children or do you go to look for a job? And so when we look at this ECD statistics, you can see there that the quintal one people really don't have the time, right? They, they've got time poverty in a way, if you think about it. They don't have the time to go and look for children, uh, to go look for jobs. I won't go through the education outcomes because I think most of you are familiar with them, but also since we're talking about how poverty is multidimensional, but to look at the healthcare statistics um, here and some of the issues that are being raised about budget, because that's our area, to say that because the healthcare budget has not increased significantly, we've got many vacancies in our healthcare sector and not just vacancies, um, it is underfunded and overstretched. So you've got children, if you look at the infant mortality rates there, right? <coughs> the infant mortality rate is actually increasing, which is against what we said we'd do in the National Development Plan. So we are rescinding in our, you know, in our progress towards the National Development Plan, even in health, right? And so there, the under five mortality rate, and then the burden of malnutrition. I've heard some people talk about um, the malnutrition, and I'm sure um, the later presentation will talk about it. So I won't go too much into this, but to say one of the critical things that people need to be able to conduct social reproduction, including taking care of children, is access to basic services. It is not the same to take care of children if you're spending an hour walking to get water versus if you have running water in your household. And so what we're finding at the PBO is that the, the people who are entitled to free basic services are actually declining, which means municipalities are basically giving less and less um, to the people who actually need it the most, even though we know that poverty is increasing, right? So we should be seeing the same increases here. And so what we found is that between 2018 and 2019, a th a one million less people got free water in municipalities and 645,000 plus got less storage and sanitation and electricity. So millions of households are eligible, but they're not getting them. Um, and I can talk a lot about the municipal structure and how we expect them to solve finance, which is a whole other public budgeting issue. Uh, but to say that, you know, social reproduction in South Africa is becoming harder for the people who are the poorest because they're not getting their entitlements, right? And not just that, another thing is that electricity, look at the prices from 2010 to 2020, rates and taxes have increased by 118%. Rates, electricity tariffs by 177% and water tariffs by 213%. So it's not just about having water, it's also can you afford water? Can you afford electricity? And, and there this graph is basically showing how many people or what the budget, who, they, who government budgets for and who actually receives the free basic services. So you see the large gap, right? So eight million recipients are not getting electricity. Seven, almost eight million people are not getting water who should be getting it. Sanitation, eight million. So we've got millions of people who are not receiving what they should. And so here I highlight the National Development Plan, and part of it is all about public basic services, right? The National Development Plan says that reducing inequality, part of the approach is social protection, which we'll be talking about, and this includes schools, free basic services, and subsidized public transport, and I can ask you what we've done so far with public transport. And to promote sustainable 
livelihoods, it's important that individuals and families, irrespective of income, can access services. And as we know, millions of people are not accessing these. So what we say at the PBO is that the social wage is actually not being protected, even though the you know government might posit that 51% of the budget um, will be to the social wage, but it is actually inadequate in itself to meet our developmental needs. So moving to the budget, and I'll move very quickly through this, um, but to really say that government is pursuing a primary budget surplus. And what does that mean? It means that your expenditure is less than revenue. And in accounting terms, I don't know if, who's done accounting in this room. That's a good sign, right? <laughs> if your expenditure is less than your revenue. But in economics, that is not true. In economics, a budget surplus has real costs on society, right? So when people aren't receiving their services, there are long-term costs. Um, and I'll give an example. Greece, um, during their austerity program, they cut a needle exchange program because they thought, you know, we're going to cut this program, we're going to save, I don't know how much it was, like let's say 50 million euros or whatever. But what happened is that they ended up having a spike in new people getting infected with HIV and AIDS. And you can only calculate yeah. what the long-term costs of that 50 billion pounds for the one year means. So we mustn't think of this as just short-term losses, but actually there are very long and significant um, costs for pursuing, pr pursuing a budget surplus, you know? What will a budget surplus do for us? That is the question we have to ask. What does it mean for a society? And of course, oh, before I move on, to say that we also know that Treasury is not going to get the surplus because the early data on revenue shows that we're actually going to undercollect. So this was a, a, a pipeline dream in a way. <laughs> but here to focus here, so we do real per capita spending um, analysis, and this is basically taking into account inflation and population growth. So what this is showing here is that we're going to be spending, in 2025-26, if we continue on the budget 2023, we'll be spending more less per South African than we did in 2016-2017. So we are significantly reducing expenditure on South Africans. And of course, there's a spike during COVID because 2020, 21. But really to say the general trend and the first time fiscal consolidation is in the budget is 2012. So we've, we've been had over a decade in this pursuit of reducing expenditure. And it has had significant impacts on our economy. And so what we've always said is that, you know, the budget continues with austerity, and even though it has shown that it has failed, because what has happened to debt to GDP in our country? It's increased, right? Despite all these efforts to cut expenditure, it has increased. And so we argue that the assumption that cutting expenditure will lead to a lower debt to GDP ratio is actually flawed, and that the costs are being, being shouldered by households. So that's one of our critical analysis points to say that the consequences are households are the ones who are facing higher levels of unemployment, poverty, and inequality, and that reducing expenditure is actually reproducing the structural issues that we see in the economy. And then lastly, I know we had a DSD um, a presentation the other day with DSD, yeah. um, <laughs> and it was fun. Uh, but to say that, you know, there's been a debate over the years about um, we should cut spending because departments are unable to spend. And as the PBO, we've actually undertaken in a lot of departments to assess how much underspending is there really, you know? Are departments just really not spending the money? Um, and what we've said is that we, we are concerned because it undermines the much needed service <coughs> delivery. So at DSD, here's our wonderful table. You can see that DSD, it, it looks very red, but DSD is actually doing very well. And DSD is underspending, is not underspending by more than 2%. So we put a 2% threshold because government allows for departments to overspend by 2%, so we assumed 2% under should be acceptable. But to say that DSD is a department that is capable and is spending their budgets. So the argument that we can't give more money to DSD does not hold, right? Uh -huh. So we cannot say they're not spending. Saving the day. <laughs> saving the day. But, the but there are issues, right? <laughs> there are issues, the reasons for underspending. And one of our arguments is that sometimes cutting budgets actually perpetuates underspending. Right, so one of them is compensation of employees, and some of you might have seen that they are constraining, right, how many people can be hired. So in the short run, if this happens or continues, it means that there'll probably be a bit more underspending. I'm not saying it will happen, 
but if it does, the compensation of employees will be a result of this, the stringent reforms that are taking place. So you see there that DSD was underspending because um, was driven by vacant posts not being filled. But what happens if National Treasury says you can't fill posts? It means this will continue to be an underspending reason. Of course, supply chain problems. This is across all departments we looked at. Challenges with new programs, but of course ECD has moved out. So, but with a new program, you do expect that there'll be some underspending to some extent because you can't foresee everything um, and delays in project uh, completion and invoicing. So just in conclusion to say that um, our consistent concern at the PBO is, has been the cost of balancing the books, looking at the fact that by government-owned admission, we are unlikely to realize many of the NDP outcomes. And so the broad issue in economics actually has been this idea that economic policy or fiscal policies about balancing the books, but like I said, that is not economics. And someone said what they've come to learn is that economics is, the, is people confusing stocks and flows. So I think we are having a significant issue here about this distinction between an accounting exercise and an economic policy exercise, which are different. Um, and so we've spoken about how the economy requires real investment. We've had huge financialization. And so we need real investment in our, into our economy, which our fiscal policy can do. More government spending, particularly to households, is something that we, we really push for and, and really advocate for so that we can boost aggregate demand. And so when we talk about boosting the economy, government expenditure can boost our economy. Um, and so of course, fiscal policy is a tool for redistribution. We spoke about the income inequality, the wealth inequality. How do we solve that? We use our fiscal policies in a smart way um, to do that. Um, and lastly, just to say that we need to have fiscal policy that takes into account the regenerative interaction between public investment, labor productivity, socioeconomic development rights and equity. So this means that, you know, when people talk about grants, for example, they kind of act as though it's like a black hole, like you throw money in there and then it's like gone. The economy doesn't, it's just, just money that fell somewhere. But actually grants, for example, have real economic implications, right? Like people talk about fiscal multipliers and I don't want to make these arguments about why fiscal multipliers are the reason we should have higher grants or whatever. But to really say that grants do play a critical economic role in our society. I mean, just think 16% of what you dis disperses grants comes back as VAT, right? At a minimum, excluding petrol and everything else that people consume. And so I think we need to think about grants and policy in a very different way and about how the economy really, truly works. Um, and that's all for me. Thank you very much. Uh, my sister, uh, Ms. Sibego, I want to know which school did you go to? <coughs> which university did you go to? So one of your lecturers at SOAS taught me, actually, from SOAS. Maybe it's the Sibeko Brains. <coughs> so, so I felt like I went back to school. Um, I told you we're having fun, right? Just ask the person next to you, are you still having fun? <coughs> you, you know, you know um, my sister, there are fundamental facts that you've put forward here, uh, which are very interesting and very useful. Um, you confirm that parenting is hard, right? Mm -hmm. And adulting is very hard. Brilliant. I think <coughs> the one lesson which I think is so important that you put forward is the long-term implications of budget cuts. And the fact that we don't understand what we're doing to the future in certain instances when we do that. But I also like the fact that you did your research. You understand what the facts say. Unlike some people, Minister, who suggested <coughs> some time ago that uh, the department underspent by 15 billion rand on the SRD grant. That's what they suggested. Without doing research, without understanding how the numbers work, they go and put, out, put that out there and suggest that we are not spending as a department. Just absolute lies. But I appreciate people who take time to go into the data and make an analysis of what the, paper, what the data is telling you. I think this is very useful and very important uh, figures and facts that you put forward. Are you ready for a little bit more of that? Yeah. Are you? 
Okay, right, at this point in time, can you give uh, my sister a hand one more time? Uh, I want to go to the school that you went to. <coughs> uh, but it must be expensive there at SOAS. Uh, but thank you very much. At this point in time, I'd like you to put your hands together for Dr. Kath Hall, as well as Paula Proudlock from the Children's Institute, and they will talk to you um, and give you a presentation on the findings and the recommendations of this report. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, Minister, um, Minister Zulu and colleagues from government, uh, from civil society, from the media, from our international partners, it's um, really fantastic to be able to um, deliver some, some of this report today. Um, it'll be very brief. We encourage you to read the report because there's a lot of detail in it. Um, we, I'm just going to wait for the presentation to come up. Here we are. Thank you. Um, I'm Catherine Hall, I'm from the Children's Institute, and I'm one of the authors of the report. Another author, Debbie Badlander, who is well known to many, uh, is not here today, and with me is my colleague Paula Proudluck, um, also an author on the report. The Children's Institute is a, a multidisciplinary uh, policy unit at the University of Cape Town. And being multidisciplinary, what we do, what we aim to do is to bring different lenses um, to look at problems. So I'm a sociologist, Paul is a lawyer, we have people in public health, uh, we have social workers, we have a, a variety of people. So this is why Paula and I are going to be kind of jumping up and down a little bit and talking to bits, the, bits, the parts of the report that we, are, um, that we have authored and are most familiar with. Um, I also just want to extend a big thank you to our um, colleagues at DSD. Um, launching this report is the end of a long process of really interesting engagement, um, and it's been an incredible partnership. Um, it's also, we know, just the very beginning of what's going to be a long process of taking this work forward. Um, so here we are at this moment, and this is where the discussions will be very useful, because they all may, may also help to guide us in how to um, what arguments to make, how to take this work forward. So we, um, we go, this is an overview of what we'll do today. We're going to move very swiftly. Um, we have to start with the history of the CSG. We think we know the history, but actually when we went into it, it's very complicated and there were difficult decisions that were made along the way and we've got to bear those in mind. So we're going to go and get that context. Then we're going to talk a bit about the impacts of the CSG. There's a huge literature. We didn't do a whole lot of new research on this because it's been done many times, including in work that's been commissioned by the DSD, by SASA, by UNICEF, um, and a whole lot of other work. But we've um, pulled that together and just updated some things where we could. Then we'll look at child poverty trends and dynamics. Um, and we're taking quite a long view of this. We're kind of going back two decades, but we also are now looking at what happened in recent years where something shifted. Um, and I will say that we'll be pre presenting, the problem with writing a report, of course, is that once you get into layout and planning a launch, it starts going out of date. And in the meantime, we've had new um, data that has come out, which we quickly analyzed, so we're updating some of that. And we'll be able to bring it up to 2022. Um, we have to talk about poverty, poverty lines and what these mean in relation to the cost of a child, and then we'll talk about some options that we modeled for increasing the CSG, which was specifically what the DSD asked us to do. And in this, we looked at what would be the impact of it. Who does it cover? Children and beyond. Like, who else does it cover? Um, what is its reach? What would its impact be on poverty? What are the implications of um, doing it? And then a, a, a look at what does this mean from a policy perspective? Do we need to change policy? What are the administrative implications? What are the legal implications? And how would it be viewed by those who do legal analysis, such as the international treaty bodies? So that's a kind of road map, and we've got a road map going on the side, so you can see how we're doing for time. And I'm going to hand over to Paula now, who will just talk a bit about the policy development. 
Good morning, everybody. So we're going to tell you a little bit about the story of the birth and the growth of the CSG. It's a 20-year story, which we will try and tell you in about five minutes max. Um, you can read the chapter in the, the book for the full story. And there are many people in this room who've been there along that journey. I can see many of them um, because it is a long journey. There's some old people in the room as well as a result. <laughs> <laughs> So we, we're going to tell you a bit about the political landscape at the time of the CI's birth and design. Um, then we're going to look at when it was introduced, there were some compromises and trade-offs that had to be made. And then the growth over the next two decades. Um, the growth in the take-up, so that's the growth in the numbers. The age threshold, which moved from 7 to 18. And the income threshold, which also was adjusted. And then we're going to look at the grant amount, which is very much the focus of this study. So at the time when the CSG was being conceptualized, South Africa just emerged from apartheid into a constitutional democracy with the Bill of Rights. And our Bill of Rights included what we called in law justiciable. Can you say that? Justiciable. Okay. Justiciable um, socioeconomic rights. Okay. And they're justiciable because it means they're enforceable by courts of law. And this was done in order to ensure that our constitution could actually achieve its transformative agenda of substantive equality. And the right to social assistance is pivotal to achieving that transformation because it's one of our best redistribution programs. It moves money from the wealthy to the poor. One can debate and question whether it's mo it has moved enough and we are still moving enough, but it has that huge re redistribution effect. The other important right um, that had to be put into effect was children's right to basic nutrition. And we'll talk a bit more about that later when we look at the rights. So when the CSG was being designed, there was already a social assistance program in place under the apartheid state, but it was racially discriminatory and very outdated and based on incorrect assumptions. So now because of the Bill of Rights um, and the new constitutional democracy, all our laws had to be reformed, and this included our social assistance laws. In 1993, most of the amounts and values of the grants were equal for different races, but the, the access was significantly unequal, particularly for the majority of African children, especially those in the former homelands. And you will see later in the research how that is the group of children who are still been disadvantaged and discriminated against. So that legacy is still with us. And in 1996, when the, the CSG was designed, social grants were reaching a total of 2.5 million people who were mostly elderly and people with disabilities. Amongst those 2.5, there were 400,000 women and children who were getting the state maintenance grant. So when the, the committee who had to design this grant had to uh, you know, work on it, they had to ensure that they would do away with all these discriminatory features of the state maintenance grant and that they would reach millions more children. They were also instructed by the Ministry of Finance at the time that they had to remain within the budget of the existing state maintenance grant, which at that time only reached 400,000 children and was an amount of 1.2 billion. So here you can see the dance between uh, social development and the Minister of Finance already coming in. It's always there. Um, and so the committee and cabinet had to make difficult choices about the value of the grant, the qualifying age, and the income thresholds. The result in 1998 was the introduction of a low-value grant targeted at young children under seven and with a means test. So it was targeted at children living in poverty. When challenged on the low amount, the Minister of Social Development that at the time, who was Geraldine Fraser Moliketti, um, was very clear that it's a contribution from the state to the cost of the child, 
and that is part of a package of support uh, measures, which included other parts of the social wage, such as free basic health care and subsidized housing. So those were the assumptions within which it came in. It was also based on an assumption of employment. You know, that the parents actually had a contribution of income to make and that the state was going to add to that, not cover the full costs of, of raising a child. So here's the, um, the final determination that was made through the, um, the executive and parliamentary process. The age threshold was set at seven years, children under seven. The income was 800 rand per month for urban formal areas and 1,100 for rural and informal. And the amount was 100 rand per child. That amount of 100 was based on a type of poverty level that was developed by the University of Port Elizabeth at the time, UPE, called the household subsistence level. And it was based on the cost of food and clothes for a child in a low income household. So one can see that the starting rationale for the CSG was that it would cover the costs of food and clothing. And so we need to ask ourselves, you know, over these 20 years, does it still do that? And, and Catherine's going to tell you a bit more about that. And now, the, the, the wonderful thing about um, how the CSG was designed in those early years is that it had these levers that you could move to expand it. You could move the age threshold, you could move the income threshold, you could move the amount. And you, depending on which lever you chose to move and expand, so the grant would reach more children. And the civil society activists, many of whom are in the room here, used those levers as advocacy, advocacy tools to push for expansion. Um, champions within government, um, at that stage particularly Minister Zola Squia, champion within government for those expansions using those very same levers. The Minister of Finance always opposed the expansions, so this is again not a new story, it will always be with <laughs> us. And what one must remember about these levers is that Every time social development wants to change one of these things, they need the concurrence of the Minister of Finance. That is built into the legislative framework. So this decision can only be made by those two ministers. And if those two ministers, while dancing with each other, don't agree, can't find the same um, you know, rhythm, <laughs> then we don't get that expansion. <laughs> But the good story, you know, the, the, the past, in the past we have a good story to tell is that the, you know, the Minister of Social Development and the activists pushing for expansion won the day and s over time the CSG was expanded to reach many more children using those levers. So here you can see the graph which shows that expansion. Um, the red line shows how the numbers of children grew over the years. And you can see that in particularly in 2003, when the age um, extension started, so when the decision was made to start extending from age 7 to 18, it started to really take off. So from 2003 to 2013 is its most massive growth. Um, that is the same time that you see the child food poverty line dropping by 20 percentage points, which is phenomenal. So you can see, by pumping more money into poor households with children, you reduce that child food poverty rate by 20 percentage points. We then see it stabilizing a bit um, from 2013 onwards, and it's interesting also that Busi has mentioned that in 2012 is when the consolidation, fiscal consolidation started, because you'll see a stagnation starting to happen, and Catherine will tell you a bit more about that. Oops, okay. So, um, just the last bit about the age um, is that also, also just to remind everybody that in that first, in when it was first introduced in 1998, you can see that for the first year there, it didn't really move. It only reached 34,000 children. And that was because there were conditions attached to it. And these conditions actually hampered access. And in 1999, when they took them away, then the um, uptake just, just soared. And one of those conditions they had there was that the mother had to prove that she had tried to find the father, that she had um, tried to make him pay maintenance, she'd gone to maintenance court, and she hadn't managed to achieve that. 
Okay, and that condition just stopped many women in their tracks, and that's why you didn't see any growth. The minute that was taken away, it just soared. Okay, so that's one of the really important lessons for us to bear in mind. Mm -hmm. I'm handing over to mm -hmm. my colleague for the next bit of the story. Yeah, the actually the other <laughs> the other condition that was removed because they had to move, remove the conditions because they realised they created obstacles. The other condition was about employment. You had to show that you'd been to an employment office and tried to get a job. So what what these conditions were was they were requiring people to do things which actually then had to they had to get some kind of verification from an institution and it was just not possible. So we must remember, you know, the lessons that we've learned from the past. Thank you, Paula. Um, um, okay, so just briefly something about the impacts of the CSG, and it's been much talked about, so I won't spend a long time on it, but it has very strong redistributive effects. Um, and we might not think so, because we still have, we still live in the, uh, in the most unequal society in the world. All the, it would be worse without um, the social grants that we have. Um, impacts beyond poverty reduction, the CSG, was designed to reduce poverty and to cover the nutritional cost of a child. As you will see, it's done so much more. Beyond all expectations, we mustn't underestimate what it's managed to achieve, even with that small amount. These are things that can be ramped up. Um, child, uh, well, just a little look at the child poverty rates and trends, and then a, a look at the impact of lockdown. So this is kind of what we're getting into in this section. So firstly, just to make the point, We've got a very strong social protection program. It's perhaps one of the it's perhaps one of the greatest strategies that we've had um, in democracy to address poverty. Um, three quarters of all spending on social assistance goes to the poorest 40% of the population. So it's well targeted. Um, social grants raise the share of the national income by households in the poorest quintiles, substan well, substantially in, in percentage terms, but only to a tiny bit, because as you can see, and here's, remember what the income distribution looks like in the country, massively unequal, okay, so the richest 10% earn more than 50% of all the income in the country, the poorest less than, substantially less than 10%. That picture would look even worse without social grants, but clearly there's not enough, um, there's not enough redistribution going on, and there's not enough to imp in increase incomes at the bottom end. Um, these these are the results of social grants. They've also had impacts on on inequality. Um, there have been ge uh, uh, Gini analyses. Um, the redistributive redistributive impacts of the CSG are not that great because the amount is so low. Um, but even these redistributive impacts would not have been possible without the CSG, because remember, this is the most pro-poor, it is in fact the really, the, the, the pro-poor targeted of all the social grants. So some of, the, some of the other permanent social grants don't have means tests at all. Some have very high means tests. The CSG is specifically targeted to the poorest, so that's what's contributing to the redistribution. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll talk about the impacts now. So a lot of, information on the impacts, go to the report and read more about them. And we've also um, yeah, been thinking a lot about how we address common concerns that keep on coming back about the child support grant. It, it does this, people waste the, well, I can't even repeat them. Um, but you know what they are. But actually it's in the impact data that we can see that we have the evidence that to counter those. Okay, so we saw a m huge uptake in birth registration. Which was a which was a very a, a good early success of the child support grant. Now there are some obstacles to complete birth registration, and even there, the grants program has got an alternative solution. If you if you're struggling to register a child, you can still get a grant through a regulation in the Social Assistance Act, and then hopefully your birth registration can be regularised. Um, impacts on infant and child nutrition, and this comes out of a broader finding, which is that analysis on the expenditure of the grant finds that. Recipients of the grant are likely, relative to others, it's income spend more on food and less on what are called sins or alcohol, tobacco, gambling, and so on. Um, so it, it, it is spent on food. There are child health outcomes that are really important. So more early access to, um, to growth monitoring at clinics, that also means you're in touch with clinics, immunization rates are better, 
Um, other outcomes actually in terms of actual health, health outcomes have been documented. In terms of early childhood development, and this relates to um, uh, you know, something that was already said earlier, which is that um, many caregivers can't even seek work because they've got to look after their children. In fact, the, the CSG is often spent on childcare. Um, so it has, and, and then y in relation to that, there are labor, um, labor impacts as well. It's, um, it's also spent on access to early childhood um, development services. The impacts for school-aged children, of course, 70% of schools are no-fee schools, but there's still a lot of costs associated with, children, with schooling, and the CSG can help with those. Um, th we see improved educational outcomes in better grade progression rates and so on, the impacts of adolescence, these are really important, I'll come back to it, because of the recurrent concerns about teen pregnancy, which is a kind of an assumption, but it's not what we're seeing. Um, and in fact, so few teenage mothers get the grant, um, that, you know, that, that clearly th this is not an incentive. Um, uh, then protective effects for teens as well in adolescence, so delayed sexual un onset, fewer partners, this has come out of the evidence too. And then even beyond children, there are impacts for households and for caregivers. And this is what also are called multiplier effects. So there's evidence, for example, of um, increased labor force participation. Interestingly, um, uh, often uh, the, the, the impact is more in um, enabling women caregivers to seek work, not necessarily to find it. So yes, there is another side to this picture, which is about which is about the labor market. Um, but but we, we're not seeing dependency, we're seeing more labor engagement. Um, just to come back to the teen fertility thing, we, we, our fertility rates are declining. They have been for years and they're continuing to do so. What we have actually now, was we are sort of in a process of demographic transition where our, uh, our infant birth rate is stable, our population is starting to age. Um, Women who receive the CSG are less likely to have another pregnancy in the next few years, so they're not rushing to get another child. There's no evidence of CSG um, teen fertility increase, and this has been documented in a number of studies. Um, other factors will be driving teen pregnancy, and those have to be addressed. For those vulnerable 14-year-olds who are falling pregnant because of other vulnerabilities. Um, so, I mean, here, you, here's a picture of... Um, I don't think you can see the end. It goes down at the end, by the way, <laughs> um, of the of the CSG beneficiaries. I mean, you can see the uptake. It's less than one percent of all child support grants go to caregivers who are under under the age of twenty. Uh, um, okay, let's come to looking at poverty. Now we've got three official national poverty rates. So, and these are our last. I put these these stats up. They're quite old. They come from the 2014-15 Living Conditions Survey, but we haven't had an income expenditure. Well, we have, but it hasn't been released yet since then. So these are the what are regarded as the last official poverty rates. Um, okay, and there's an upper bound line, which is just enough to live. There's a lower bound line, which requires making sacrifices on basic essentials, and there's a food poverty line below, which you don't have enough food to survive um, and develop. And this is how the population is stacked, the population overall. And the point I want to make here is that we have to disaggregate our data. We have to keep on looking at women and children. Okay, look at the rates for men, lower than the average. Okay, against each of these, rates for women are higher. And if we look at child poverty rates, that's what they look like. Okay, so children are disproportionately poor in this country. And it's there are a range of reasons. It's partly because of where they live in low-income households where income has to be shared between more people because they have children to look after. Um, in, again, I don't think you can see at the end. I wonder if we could just move that chair for a moment. Um, in, um, in, in households with women, female-headed households and also female households that only have women, no men in them, these households are poorer. Um, and also there's a special distortion to it. The children are often cared for in rural areas. They're not necessarily the, the, the children of parents who live in rural areas. Many of those parents are working elsewhere. But they are primarily cared for in rural areas. Why? Because actually you need women who are not working to care for children if parents are going to try and seek work. So there are a whole lot of household strategies that are going on around here. But it means that children are often um, 
in the poorest households. So just remember, those are the official poverty lines. We now track it using another survey that also conducted by Statistics South Africa, um, a nationally representative survey, the General Household Survey. It's not generally regarded as an ideal source of income data, but when we track it over time, I've just plotted those official figures for those years. It's, it aligns very closely with what are regarded as official figures. And what we see here is what Paula was describing on all three poverty lines, a reduction in p child poverty, a, a dip particularly in the upper bound line and then an increase. And I'm going to tell you more about what happened. I'm going to break this up into segments because there were different phases in which this happened. So here in this graph, we're plotting the, the bars of a number of children. Remember that, that fast uptake. And we're looking here just from between two, 2000 and basically a 10 year period of that um, rapid uptake. Um, when the number of beneficiaries increased from 2.6 million to 11.3. Okay, over that period. And we see this massive 20 percentage point drop in poverty. We're tracking this, this is the child food poverty line. So this is 53% of children were in households where they couldn't get enough to eat. That was decreased quite rapidly. Um, and um, you see a little flat line, which is around the time of the global recession. And what we see is that children were effectively protected from rising po poverty at that time. You'll see it again later in the next um, big economic shock that happened. Um, then they start to stabilize. Okay, and if we move into the next period, you just see that the poverty rate flatlines. Okay, our, our numbers are not rising rapidly. We've already reached out, our, we've completed the age extension to 18. Um, and we're not reducing poverty anymore. So at this point, we're not having progressive realization <laughs> anymore. Okay, we're just maintaining. Okay, then we move into the next period. And this is a bit of a complicated thing because something happened in 2020, um, which is that for a portion of the time, there was disaster relief and there were top-ups to the grants. Um, and there was a caregiver grant that went to every caregiver who received a child support grant. Um, so we've measured it in two, in two ways. We can do this in the data by adding those top-ups amount, amounts in or not, okay? So without da disaster relief, that poverty rate for children, that food poverty rate shot up to 39%. That's massive. Um, this is the impact of the temporary disaster relief. It actually offset rising poverty in 2020. But remember, those grants were only paid for a few months. So for much of the year, a lot the children were at the higher level. That's why we've given you two options to look at. But this is an important thing because it shows that protective effect against economic shocks. Um, and then what we see after that is poverty continuing to rise. So this is what we've updated now. In 2022, our poverty rates didn't come down. We were out of lockdown. There was some clawback in employment, um, but not, not, not enough. And our poverty rate is now substantially higher than it was. If we look at the picture, here's that picture over the whole period. Okay, so we see the massive down. Now, what we can see is that actually our child food poverty headcount is basically as high as it was over a decade ago. We've lost all that time. Um, and this is where we need to intervene now because that is, you think of young children at this point, and I know we talk in numbers, eight million children, but each one of those children is a child who's not getting enough nutrition who has a caregiver who's having to make terrible plans and compromises, um, times that by hundreds, thousands, millions. Um, so, um, uh, sorry, at the same time, you can't really see it because the numbers are so huge. We've had a slight dip in CSG uptake. And this was an important thing. It was also affected by COVID and lockdown. So what happened in COVID, of course, home affairs offices closed. Okay. Over 20,000 children are born every week in this country, and they didn't stop being born in lockdown, okay? <laughs> they couldn't get registered, okay? So the top line shows our child population, okay? It's, it's, fairly, it's fairly stable. In fact, you can, it's, it's done this slight thing over the years, and it's projected, I've looked at projections up into the 2036, it's, it's projected to come down, okay? Um, um, our current year birth, birth registrations, you can see that huge dip in 2020. Um, um, some, some claw back in 2021, 
but that was current year birth registrations. In other words, a lot of children who were born in 2020 weren't registered in 2020. Children born in 2021 could get registered, but those ones who hadn't been registered in 2020, who now had to do late birth registration, which is much more complicated, the Department of Home Affairs were not prioritizing those. Okay, so, so there's a huge knock-on effect in delays in registration. Okay, and what we're seeing now, this, the bottom line is children under one infants who, who are receiving the child support grant. And we're seeing that number coming down, and this is SASA, um, this is your, the SASA report from 2023. Numbers still continuing to come down in 2023. So we know, so much of the evidence, and I didn't make the point, is about the impacts are most strongly felt if children access the grant very early from birth and you have to have sustained access, that's when you see the impacts. It can't kick in when a child is three or four or six. So um, we've, you know, we've, there have been many studies and we know that DSD has been worried and SAS have been worried about that, that exclusion, that high exclusion of under ones for years. It's becoming more of a problem, so we're gonna have to address that too. Um, at the same time, we're also seeing a rise in child hunger. Okay, and there was a lot of talk about this during COVID. We, there was a huge impact on hunger that was recorded during COVID. This is just quintile one and quintile two, and if you're not used to the language of quintiles, it's the poorest 20% of the population, and the next poorest 20%. So these are very poor households. If you think of that, that income distribution, very poor. And um, hunger, reported hunger rates for children in households were coming down. What we've seen is that they sta started rising. They rose in 2020. Probably some of, some of what would have been rising child hunger was offset by that disaster relief, but continuing to rise even now. So everything is pointing to a new problem of rising child poverty and malnutrition. Uh, 2016, interestingly, was the year in which the uh, Demographic and Health Survey was conducted, where they came up with that important figure, 27% of children under five in South Africa are stunted. Okay, in that year, you can see the hunger rate also was quite high in that year. What bothers me is we're starting to approach that level again. Um, and from that, here is a map. There's South Africa with its 27% stunting rate. And stunting is a result of, long, of chronic undernutrition. And we know that that is caused by poverty. This is mapping countries across the world, okay? You've got your, um, your, your income level of the country at the bottom, going along the bottom, so you'd expect the, m the higher the income of a country, the lower the stunting rate, okay? Um, South Africa is an outlier on that curve. A country like ours should not have that high a stunting rate. Um, and the problem with stunting is it's very hard to recover from it. It has all kinds of implications for educational outcomes and long-term health outcomes. So um, this is because of our inequality and our high child poverty rates. So then we start thinking, okay, well, so what should we raise the, the, the child support? Grow up? You know, how much does it cost to raise a child? Now, we, DSD asked us to do this, and we kept on saying, well, no, we can't come up with a single number. Um, there are so many estimates, and this actually um, was from an award. It won an award, uh, this piece of work by um, an economist um, who said it costs seven and a half thousand rand a month minimum to raise a child. Now. Raising a child like that, it's, it, what it brings to mind is the massive inequality, okay, that we have in this country. Many of what wealthier parents would regard as basic essentials for, for their children are beyond the wildest dreams of poor caregivers, okay. So, you know, we've, we, we, we can't go to Treasury and say we want 7,500 rand a month for, for the child, you know, it would be nice, but um, we've got to be realists. Um, so we've got to start thinking about well, what is what is the amount? How do we how do we base it, and how do we have any kind of objective base? And we can already see that th there are lots of estimated costs of children. This is a high one, um, uh, but they've always been variable. And this is going back to 1998 when the CSG was introduced. Remember, it was 100 rand. Okay, at that stage there were already a whole lot of state transfers based on the the cost of caring for a child. So a residential care subsidy was 850. The foster child grant was almost three times the value of the child support grant. Um, 
there, there are these variable costs. The child support grant, grant has always been the smallest because partly based on this, uh, what Paula said, it evolved from the state maintenance grant and there actually was an assumption that there was income, that there, that there was some earning going on in households. With our unemployment rates, which, which you know, in broad un unemployment terms are well over 40% still, that's not happening. Um, there are also all kinds of variations if you plot if you look at the different values of the grants, which are also estimates, in a way, of the cost of that complementary money that people need. And I've plotted them here against the poverty lines, just so we can see where they are. So the older person's disability and care dependency grants are, in effect, the state's estimate of wage replacement for people who can't work because they're too old or disabled. Also, or looking after disabled children. So that's a kind of a wage, a minimum wage replacement cost to enable a person to survive, not a household. If there are two, pen two pensions in the household, they each get the grant, because that's what it costs per person. The foster child grant is in a way, in this grouping, the, the state's best estimate of the cost of a child, because that child effectively is, a war is in statutory care. The state would otherwise be looking after them, but they're handing over the money to the household who does so. But this has also been eroded over time. The CSG, together with the top-up for orphan children living with relatives, interestingly, is right now, right on the food poverty line. Okay, That's the minimum that those caregivers would need just to give that child basic food. No clothes, but the food. Um, the child support grant and the SRD are the two grants that are substantially below the child poverty line. Not a little bit below, substantially below. Um, and, yeah, just to say, it's often said we can't afford all these grants for children. We don't so often hear that argument in relation to elderly people. And I've got nothing against pensioners, but just to <laughs> point out that 13 million children get the child support grant, 4 million adults get the old age pension, and the budget for the old age grant is higher than the total budget for the child support grant. Um, Another way of looking, so what we've ended up doing in a lot of discussion with DSD as we did this, is let's use the South African poverty lines as, illustri as illustrators um, when we model the increases to the grants. So for many years, we didn't have official poverty lines. Okay? Eventually, StatsSA produced them after a lot of consultation. Um, they followed an internationally me uh, recognized method, the cost of basic needs approach, um, which is um, used in many countries in the world. They've, ch they've recently published their updated poverty lines. So this is what they are. 1,558, down to the last rand, is the upper bound line. And this is just enough, enough to cover basic food and non-food essentials. Okay. So this, in effect, is the, the best minimum core line we have for a person to be able to survive. A lower bound poverty line, just over a thousand rand a month, is a bit more complicated because it requires sacrifices. You've got to sacrifice some essentials in order to get enough food to eat, or else you sacrifice food because you need to buy school shoes or something like. That. Okay, so there's sacrifices involved in that, and even Stats A has warned in its in its report um, that it is the line below which one has to choose between these items, which is a hard thing to do. The food poverty line at 760 rand per person per month is just enough for basic food, and it's about meeting the calories that are recommended by the World Health Organization. But calories are different from nutrition. Okay, so. What StatsSA has done, and there's a whole methodological report in order to do it, they use the consumption habits of poor households in order to see how they meet those calories. Okay, and I'll show you that just now. I also just wanted to say then, there's an alternative in the household affordability index that is produced every year, um, which uses a slightly different approach. Okay, so they're looking at a food basket based on an adequate nutrition. Okay. For, and they've got a, a rate per for children. So you can see at um, their minimum rate now, just published in September, per child is 907 rand per child per month. So that's quite a bit higher than the status A rate. So if we think about increasing the child support grant to the food poverty line, we're really talking in minimal terms. Okay. Here's the food basket. Okay, Think of a food basket, it might look something like that. The fact is, here we have massive inequality too. Okay, wealthier households can afford to pay more per calorie to get their calories. Okay, poorer households have to get their calories in different ways, and we know that when when money is short, 
people have to cope with it by reducing the di diversity of their foods, by prioritizing non-perishable non foods, so less fruit and vegetables, um, filling foods that can be bought in bulk. Um, and this is just, you, these are, this is what goes into the stats as, as this is their basket of goods. So you can't see much in the way, there's an, it's, it's not a hugely diverse diet. I'm again making the point, the poverty line is not a generous line, it is a line where you will eat, still eat a lot of starch um, um, and have to be very careful about um, managing um, your, your household budget. Um, so I'm going to move quickly into the modeling for increased options. Just to say, in agreement with, this, with DSD, we modeled with the status quo. And earlier it was asked, we don't look at the cost of inaction. Actually, the status quo is the cost of inaction, OK? Right? So we'll look at the, s the status quo. And we're seeing what, what already is happening with the status quo, because that the amount has not been increased. Um, the we then we modeled the CSG against the different poverty lines, and we also looked at a more gradual way of phasing it in. Um, and then we looked at outcomes, and I'll take you through those. I want to say that we talked about the food poverty line, and this is very important, which is the top line there is the food poverty line over, over time, OK? Going uh, back over, well, we're looking at a 20-year period here, because we're projecting a little bit forward. Remember that the child support grant was originally linked to the cost of food and clothing. It would have been slightly above the food poverty line when it was first introduced, because it also allowed for some clothing. Okay. It's gr this, the gap between the two has widened over the years. And this is because um, of below inflation increases. It hasn't kept up with the price of food. And recently, we've seen massive food inflation. And so you're seeing that line suddenly widening. So this is an urgent, an urgent issue. It also means that even asking to increase the child support grant to the food poverty line is not asking for something more. It's simply to asking to regain what has been lost over time. Um, I'll skip through this, but it's just to say that what happens each year when Treasury projects its, um, uh, its inflation rates, and then the actual inflation rates come up, it doesn't then go back and adjust for, uh, for, for um, inflation rate uh, increases to grants that were under projected. Okay, so we do have a kind of an escalating problem over the years. Okay, so here's some numbers. In the status quo, that we, there are 14 and a half million eligible children, and as we see, there are now 13 million children receiving the grant. This was um, based on, we did this actual analysis based on 2019 data that was available in 2021. Um, we will update it when it goes, we take it forward. If it goes to Treasury, we'll be able to update the costings as well. Um, okay, if we increase it to the food poverty line, it would, it would reach m a few more children, of course, because the means test would change. Um, and you can see the numbers there. The, the most important point is that there's a huge variation in budget depending on what, you, what the increase is. But increasing the child support grant to the food poverty line, remember with the child support grant, we already have a budget of seven se 77 billion rand. So the difference is, would be the extra ask, and that would be 23 billion to increase the child support grant to the food poverty line. Um, who it would reach, in addition to all of these children, because it's so well targeted, it already reaches large numbers of women who are unemployed, okay? And that would increase at the food poverty line to 72% of all unemployed women. It would reach into 70% 70, 70 of households in the poorest two quintiles. It would also reach over half of all households where, where there isn't employment. So it's, it's incredibly well targeted generally. Um, we had to consider that Treasury might say that even 23 billion for that increase to the minimum, just to correct the value of the CSG, would be too much. In which case, what could our argument be? And that would be, okay, well, let's phase it in gradually, okay? That would smooth the impact on the budget. It wouldn't complicate the targeting mechanism or administrative. It's just literally a touch of a button. It, um, because um, SASA already has birth date details, if we phase in by age, um, it, it's then could be allow for pro progressive expansion. It's easy to implement and verify. And then strong arguments for it, because young children, for starting with the youngest children, because they don't have access to the school feeding program, because of the importance of nutrition in the early years, which can't be undone, 
because, as has been said, early life intervention is the best way to inter uh, interrupt intergenerational poverty. And there's precedent for this, because this is how the CSG started, with the youngest children, and then was phased up. So when we look at that, okay. and I won't take you through all the numbers, they're all in a report, but that reduces our cost in, th in the first year of um, to 10 billion rand to reach all children in the preschool going years and bring that CSG back up to the food poverty line where it was meant to be. Um, this can't be too big an ask. Um, we know that there's austerity budgeting, there are trade-offs, we're very concerned about the trade-offs in social spending, um, but, but this has to be, in our view, a non-negotiable. Um, and then one could phase it in, in, in three-year age groups and reach all children within five years. I'm handing back to Paula, who's going to discuss this from a legal and policy perspective. And we are very aware we are very over time, so I'm going to do Law 101 really quickly. Um, so we had to look at the legal implications of the status quo versus the um, increased options, and we had to look at how easy was this to do administratively, and also, obviously, what are the budget um, questions. So when we looked at constitutional law, the two rights we had to look at were the right to social assistance of everyone and the right to basic nutrition for children. We also looked at international law. What um, have the international treaty bodies, the UNCRC, the African Committee on the Rights and Welfare of the Child, what have they told us about the CSG and the value of the CSG? So the importance around understanding our constitutional framework is that we have the right of everyone to social assistance and this right has to be progressively realized and it's for everyone who's unable to support themselves or their dependents. It's subject to the state having available resources. So that is, what that is often the defense that the, the state would raise when challenged that the, the grants are not enough or need to be expanded as we do not have enough money. Then the state would need to show, number one, they've made progress, number two, that they are using their maximum resources, and number three, that they've prioritized children in their decision making. And to prove that the state has prioritized children, they need to show that they've done child impact assessments. So when we looked at the, we looked at case law, 20 years of case law, and we came to the legal opinion that um, Currently, the low value of the CSG is limiting children's right to social assistance. And although there's progress in coverage, what we can see is that because the poverty is going up, we, we actually don't have progressive realization. And that the children who are being adversely affected is a large number of children, um, which is a factor considered in the reasonableness test. It's 8 million children. And it's an extreme limitation because it leads to death. As you can see in Busi's data, the infant and child death rates are going up, um, malnutrition and stunting. And I think what is very debatable, and it depends who you talk to, but is the state using its maximum available resources? It depends on which economist you talk to, progressive or conservative, in the middle. Um, has the state prioritized children in its budget decision making? And have we done child impact assessments before we make these challenging decisions? And often people think you just need to do a child impact assessment when you're passing a law or policy about children, like the Children's Act. But in fact, we're supposed to be doing child impact assessments on all our decisions, including our macro fiscal policy decisions. Mm. Then when the important thing about children's right to basic nutrition is that it's not subject to progressive realization and available resources. It's an immediately realizable right. And the Constitutional Court and the High Court have clearly said that whereas the parents bear the primary obligation to feed children and ensure this right, if parents are unable, for example due to poverty, the duty shifts to the state in a secondary role and they become the provider of the food for the children. And for the state this is a very high burden because what we're looking at here are 8 million children um, who don't actually at the moment have adequate nutrition. Now, if the state is challenged for not providing adequately for these 8 million children, the state's going to have to justify its limitation based on the general limitation clause. They won't be subject to the reasonable measures test, which is what you use for everyone's socioeconomic rights. They'll be subject to a much higher standard of justification. 
And recently, the, the, the state was challenged around the National School Nutrition Program during COVID. And here, the High Court made it very clear that never will, will the, the court be able to say that starvation of a child is justifiable. So they've already interpreted that general limitation test and the right to basic nutrition and said starvation, hunger of a child, is never justifiable. So I'm just flashing you there. That's the words of the court. Um, you can find it in your summary. Um, so our legal opinion here is that the right to basic nutrition is being limited, particularly with the broad unemployment at 45%. Many parents cannot feed their children. So the assumption that parents are able to contribute to that low amount and add the money for food or clothes, that assumption is a faulty assumption. Um, and as Busia said, it's been there for 30 years and actually it's got worse. So we can't base our grant scheme on an assumption of, of employment for, for the lowest quintiles. And I think what's the, the most important is this high court precedent saying that um, starvation is, is never justifiable. We also looked at international law, and here we looked at the findings of the treaty bodies. And they've said three things. They've said, number one, the CSG value falls short of the principle of adequacy. It's not enough. And this is because it doesn't cover the basic costs. It particularly is problematic. It doesn't cover food. And it should be reviewed and increased at least to the food poverty line. They've also been quite challenging and said that the state is not using its maximum available resources to prioritize children and needs to redistribute more. And they've also said to the state, the state needs to show evidence to these UN and AU bodies that they have done child impact assessments before they make these decisions. I'm flashing those concluding observations for you. It's the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child. Already in 2016, you know, before these poverty rates began to rise. The state has just reported to this UN committee now and is going to have to go and defend that report um, in, in early next year. They're going to have to explain the rise in child poverty and the non-increase to the CSG. Here the AU is saying very similar thing. International Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. This is the committee that challenged the state around its macro financial policy and said you need to redistribute more. And that's how you can actually increase um, the social grants. We looked at policy and administrative con considerations. By increasing to any of these poverty lines, even the upper bound poverty line, we are not moving away from the original vision of the CSG, which was a complementary grant. It will still then only cover food and clothes. You know, the other basic needs won't be covered. So it's still complementary. It's not taking over the full responsibility of the cost of the child. The beauty of this proposal is that it's administratively easy to do. A few presses of the button and some government gazettes. Um, it doesn't have to go through Parliament. Okay, um, The increase can be done by government notice by using the top-up mechanism that is already in the Act and the regs in, form in, this in, the, in Section 12A. Um, it doesn't require more human resources. It doesn't require you know, more personnel budget. It's easy to administer and it would immediately have an effect for millions of poor children. The elephant in the room, do we have the money? That is debatable depending on your economic ideology. Okay, um, and, but what we're saying is that, you know, for the, for the under sixes, if we were to target those under sixes with the, at, for, at a 10 billion rand price tag to reach the under sixes as a first phase, we would be making a, a good first step. And just to remind everyone, bringing the children back into the room, who are these children we're talking about? Who are these 8 million children who are hungry? They are mostly African children. So this is indirect discrimination on the basis of race. They're mostly in the former homelands. Still that legacy of apartheid around spatial discrimination. A growing um, group of urban-based children as well. Big mm. informal settlements, particularly your under ones, you'll see Gauteng and the Western Cape lagging on the uptake for the under ones. And almost all these children are in the care of women, so indirect discrimination on the basis of women. The children worst affected are the children under six because they're not benefiting from the NSNP. Most are not accessing subsidized ECD centers. And the youngest children are most vulnerable to the effects of malnutrition due to their rapid phase of growth in that um, age group of 0 to 6. 
So that's the children in the room, and this is our this is our recommendation. You can read it. We you know we we, we sincerely believe that this vehicle has proven itself, um, and given the crisis we are in now, it has the biggest potential to reach those children, particularly because of its rural reach, um, its high efficiency, and its low leakage. There are very few middlemen. Um, it's about pumping money out to households, direct to households. It doesn't get it, there's no attrition between SASA and it getting to the people, other than a bit of bank charges. Um, you know, so it, it, and also this administrative ease is what makes it beautiful. No more personnel needed. It's a press of a button. Thank you. Can we give uh, Kath and Paula a hand? Just one more time. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Paula. I'd, l I'd want to just invite you to your seats one more time. Um, so I'm going to change the program a bit, uh, and I'm <coughs> don't worry. I get paid enough to change the program. <laughs> uh, it's part of my job description. <laughs> um, so I'm going to change the program just a bit. I, I think that was very informative information, um, and if. You were thinking about writing your master's thesis or your PhD. There are some uh, introductory notes that you can start to use on this piece of work. Um, but at this point in time, I'd like to call Dr. Wanga uh, Zembe Nkabile uh, from the Medical Research Council, as well as uh, Ms. Mastura Saddam, Sadan from the DPME. And I'm going to, uh, I don't know how much time they said you have. That's what they said, right? I mean, that's, what the program that's what the program says, right? Uh, it's not what the MC says, right? Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to try and reduce that drastically. Uh, let's try and do five to seven minutes, if that's fair. Uh, think of it when you are in that interview and they tell you you only have five minutes, justify your case. That kind of a thing. Yeah. Right, there you go. Thank you, TG. I've never been in such an interview, so <laughs> this will be my first dry run. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes, indeed. I mean, um, 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 hello to the minister again and um, DSD and partners and a lot of colleagues in the room um, that I've met in different spaces. I'm so honored and grateful to have been asked to um, give um, a, a brief reflection, my own reflections on, on the study. I think the work that um, Kath and, and Paula um, at from um, the CI has, have done is just simply outstanding. I, I've, I read the report, um, and as the CEO of the Nelson Mandela Foundation suggested, it should not be bedtime reading. Yeah. But um, this presentation was sharp, was succinct, was compelling. I don't know if you can walk out of this room after that presentation and think that we can't solve this problem, the challenge of child poverty. Whatever other reasons can be given, I don't think, after this presentation, I don't think you could say that. Um, so I'm, I'm really, really coming here to say that um, this um, um, presentation, and, and uh, well, the, the report, in reading it, it really felt like it was pulling all these different strands, individual, mm -hmm. different strands of work, that myself, the CI, others have done over the years, which were individual snapshots of what is happening in households with children. And in this report, you suddenly pull it together through this historical account that starts from when the CSG was implemented, what the underlying assumptions were, how we've paid for those assumptions by limiting the expansion of the CSG, where the shifts have occurred. And I think my biggest takeaway, given that now, my input, which I rehearsed at 2 a.m. To, to be at exactly 12 minutes, is now five minutes. <laughs> I think what it really powerfully demonstrates to me is that action is possible. The 2003-2013 year in which we saw the sharpest decline in child poverty, as these two researchers demonstrated, it didn't coincide. It happened as a result of the expansion of action, something happened in the system, and you had more children coming in. And in my own studies, which are mostly qualitative, I have a huge appreciation of my numbers, but I'm just a more qualitative <laughs> researcher. But, and what it really excited me about it is that I could see a timeline of my own work 
Like, yes, indeed, between 2003 and 2013, caregivers and children were saying something different about the child support grant and what it was doing. Those children were experiencing it. There was still, it was still a lot of hardship. But as one of my papers states, the title of it, which is a direct quote from my mother, women felt able to make a plan. And from 2013 to 2019, they felt less able to. And then when COVID hit, you know, something worse than anything we could have imagined happened. But again, COVID, one of the few gifts of COVID that happened for the social s security system of this country is that that five to six month period that um, Kath and Paula were talking about when we had that social relief of um, relief package, the disaster management relief package that was instituted, which had top ups and new grants and food parcels introduced, um, we saw the numbers. So I'm able to provide qualitative stories because I actually went back to the women that I'd been researching as part of a longitudinal quantitative study. I went back to them during COVID to hear qualitative accounts of what is happening. And those women were telling me during lockdown, which was extremely hard for me, I needed mental health intervention because I was at home, I was a mother myself, and I was talking to them on the phone, and they were saying things that I simply could not imagine. And these are women I'd been following for six years, and now we were at a point that was just un unimaginable. And then the social relief package came, and many of those women were saying to me, for the first time since I had this child that you've been following up, and since I've had my children, I experienced financial stability, food security stability for the first time. And initially I was saying to Paula and, and, and Kath that initially I thought, how am I going to present this and say that low-income people thought COVID was better? I just didn't know how to, but here are the numbers, it did. And in 2021, when I went back to those mothers, they were saying, we're back, well, we are worse than ever before because that social relief package ended. And the gifts and the lessons of that was, if you start acknowledging, as um, Ms. Sibego's brilliant presentation did, and, and Paul and, 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 um, and Kath Hall showed, if you start acknowledging the reproductive unpaid labor of women who raise children through the caregiver's allowance that we saw in 2020, if you start to top up the grants of the other members of the household, if you start to have a more comprehensive strategy around the children who are living in those households, you suddenly say, see people saying, for the first time yeah. in those five months, I didn't have to worry about my children going hungry. So I'll close with this, um, DG. I thought, indeed, when you said the statement that I actually wrote here is what I wanted to close with, I thought, indeed, you are right in saying we are sitting here with the right people, and you are definitely the right person because you said this that yeah. it's not a matter of thinking about whether can we afford right. to, right. can, can we afford not to act? Absolutely. And we have brilliant examples, very yesterday's examples, because yeah. 2020, that five to six month window period is a very fresh example. We can act. As this country, we absolutely can. Absolutely. Thanks. Yeah. Let's give a hand. She did good. <coughs> That's great. Um, and she's a doctor, by the way. <laughs> hey! <laughs> but by school in. No, no, no. In, 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 my, in my village where I come from, uh -huh. uh, people hear a doctor and then they start coming to me and telling me, the child in the head. Awesome. No, thank you. So, Mastura will come up, and immediately after Mastura, we're going to change the program a bit. I'm going to ask the minister to come and speak to us and take a few remark, make a few remarks. And immediately after that, we'll have a round of questions. There are rules that accompany questions. So if you thought you had seven questions, uh, wait for the rules. <laughs> Thank you, Masura. Five to seven minutes. Do you want to come back? Okay, well, good morning, Minister. Um, and all protocols observed. So just to also say that I'm from the National Planning Commission, which is located within the Department of... Um, planning, monitoring, and evaluation. Um, for me, the fundamental question we have to ask ourselves is, what are we doing and what should we be doing to ensure that children thrive so that they can realize their full potential? For me, that is the fundamental question we should all be asking ourselves in South Africa. Um, 
You know, I, um, many of my notes uh, has already been presented in the report, but I, you know, in the DPME, and I see my colleague is here, we have been working on the 30-year review, because of course next year will be 30 years of democracy. And actually looking back has been such a useful exercise. And I think, you know, to commend the DSD on this report, but also to say that, you know, we must learn from the, the policies that we developed, the policy choices we made, as well as the implementation. Because I think far too often in South Africa, there's this notion that we've got the best policies we just can't implement. And if I may say so, it's a nonsense. If you look at the child support grant, you know, introduced in 1998, yes, a bit slow, but then it literally takes off. I also want to say that we must remember that in the mid-2000s, we had good rates of economic growth. So I think that the, the, the magic, if one were to say that, is the combination of grant social assistance as well as economic growth. And we can really see over the last 10 years when we've had anemic economic growth, um, what, what's almost happening is that we are expecting the social sector to compensate yeah. for the limitations of the economy. Um, and we can only compensate to some extent, isn't it? Um, now, of course, again, it was stated that the grants in general has been our most successful poverty alleviation mechanism. Um, but what we must remember, I, you know, um, earlier this year I had lunch with Alan Hirsch. Some of you might know him. He used to work in, in the presidency and then in DPME. And Alan said, Mastura, I still don't understand how we got it right. Because you must remember those 1990s, it was gear, you know, uh, it was really challenging. Okay, now you'll hear I have lots of lunches and coffees. Then I had coffee with Temba Masilela, who used to be the advisor to Minister Square here when I think he was at DPSA. And I relays, I relay the story to, to Temba. And he says, no, no, Mastura, Alan should know this. It was a uh, uh, minister square I said, yes, but he wasn't the minister at the time. Temba says, no, Mastura, in the ANC, he was supportive of the grants. And you need to understand that. Um, so I think political will minister in many ways is the key. Um, well, together with the money. I mean, we can't have the one without the other. Um, but I also just want to commend, you know, my colleagues at the time and currently in DSD, because it's also about committed bureaucrats. You know, if, if we are unfeeling people, we have no empathy for poor people, we, and uh, again, like Kath, I'm not going to repeat what other people say, but we must, we must be cogniz cognizant of these negative views that people have and in particular towards poor people, which re really is, is problematic. Let me also just say, we've got the CEO of SASA here. The, the, the introduction or the establishment of SASA was a game changer in delivering yeah. grants yeah. in general, right? Across the world, we are seen as leaders in the digitization of grant delivery. Was it last year I was in these workshops where you know, it was the World Bank people talking about grant systems and delivery. And one doesn't want to be arrogant, but you want to say, yeah, but we do this. What's yeah. the big deal? Yeah. Um, so, but we don't often enough say that to ourselves. Yeah. Then, of course, um, there has been a few blips on this very sunny uh, kind of history. Uh, the Concord finding that the CPS contract was illegal, um, the near debacle of the insourcing of grant payments. So we mustn't also rest on our laurels, you know. Um, I know that there's been some challenges with the, with the Post Bank. A small proportion of people get their grants from the Post Bank. And, and here, again, we must, uh, I, you were asking the media to tell the truth. I want to ask the media to be more nuanced. It's not just a simple story. Mm -hmm. There's more to the story. And, and that we must use this report in the same way. Now, I want to say the issue, we, we know that there are high levels of poverty in this country. And often when I speak to people, you know, th this, 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 uh, this idea in society that we've got these large numbers of people living off grants. No, I say it's children and old people. Yeah. Now, and firstly, the words living off, uh -uh, it's a right, okay? So, so we have to understand that. I also want to say that on the old age grants, whilst it's only 4 million currently, because of the changing demographic profile, it's going to increase those numbers over time 
and it's the most ex one of the most expensive grants, and so it's going to put upward pressure on the budget. So we also have to keep that in mind. But the point that you were making about the poor children or women and children who live in the former homelands, this is part of our apartheid legacy, right? Now, when um, and um, Wiseman is here, you know, again, the SRD grant, you know, compared to other countries, we did really good work in rolling that out during COVID. But work that, that Wiseman did for, for social development showed a youth and urban bias in SRD grant beneficiaries. I was a bit concerned about this. So, so yes, I mean, it's because of the digital stuff that the young people do it quickly. Um, but you, we all know that women in the former homelands who are not 60 yet are very poor. And so for me, that was a concern and remains a concern. Um, and then the take-up rate for zero to one-year-olds. I mean, this has been a long-standing issue, and the, uh, the SASA CEO is here. Already, I used to manage the National Income Dynamics Study for the presidency and then DPME. First wave, 2008, we showed the proportion of children who were not accessing the grant at the time. And we know the first two years, most well, pregnancy and the first two years, the most important. So we, we had a meeting um, with some of your colleagues in December last year, Home Affairs and Health, and said, OK, what are you doing to sort out a system where we can get uh, you know, women who just have their babies to get them onto the grant as quickly as possible. So I think I'm in imploring you to please, you know, if we can sort that out, it would really be, a, a, um, you know, progress for us. Because there's this issue of high levels of stunting. Um, I mean, for me, it's confounding. I'm surprised that the grant hasn't made more of an impact. Um, and it might be that we need to maybe disaggregate that 27% and really understand, well, I mean, I know. In case it in um, the, the place is going to, um, I'm going to forget it now, like the poorest municipality in South Africa. That's where the stunting is higher than 27%, right? Because averages hide a lot. Um, maybe j uh, on the CSG options, I, I want to say that I'm really excited by this work because not only does it give us options, it also is quite pragmatic and says, well, you can phase in these um, extensions, I mean, oh, sorry, increases, right? Because we are in a difficult situation. I don't know if people realize how challenging the, the fiscal situation is. I mean, we at work, we are kind of laughing about, okay, we're going to get paid, but we're not going to be able to do anything. <laughs> Which, I mean, I, I, I'm making it a joke, but it's actually quite serious. Because I say, I get a very good salary. I'm in decile uh, 10 on, on your graph. Yeah, we all are, <laughs> Kath says. But I must work for my money. I, you know, I can't, uh, in, my conscience won't allow me to not do anything. Yeah. So really it's about choosing an option and phasing it in. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm going to just talk a little bit about the 10-year review, and then I've got a just a few more points, Linton. I know you are. Okay. So in the 10-year review, which we released uh, two weeks ago, we say that the CSG has contributed to the to the reduction in child hunger. Um, the challenge has been the value of the CSG. So in the NPC, we are saying that as well, which falls well below the food poverty line. And it's not been sufficient to reduce the burden of stunting. Now, I'm not going to be popular when I say this. Ultimately, it's about choices we make as a country. It's about competing needs, and it's about trade-offs. Trade-offs is a dirty word in South Africa. Nobody wants to trade anything off. But can we afford to trade off our children? We can't. And in this difficult environment, surely that's what we should be saying. Our children should come first. And I think that for, for, for DSD this and, and for others in this room, we have a job on our hands. We have to convince people about the important role that the CSG <laughs> plays currently, but that actually it, we have to increase the CSG for it to have more of an impact. And as you say, administratively, <coughs> it could be relatively easy. But in this very diffi difficult <laughs> fiscal environment, I mean, you know, sorry, I, I, got, a, I got back pay. I went, I, I'm scared when I get money in my account and I don't know anything. I say, why did I get, what is, what money is this? I said, 
Can we afford to give me an increase? Of course, I'm not going to say no to the money. Let's come, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a martyr. But I don't think we should have gotten an increase, you know. If you were, if you were to ask me, what, what, where would I want the money to go? I'd actually support. I, I'd say I'd forfeit. Okay, maybe not all, let's be honest. <coughs> I'm not Mother Teresa. But a 10 billion in the biggest scheme of things, it's not that much. Yes, it is 10 billion every year and then 23 billion at the end. And as uh, Kath was saying to me, if we increase to the upper bound poverty level, we'd actually be eradicating child poverty. Mm, unfortunately, realistically, we're probably not going to go there. Um, but I think that we, I, I think we should have a campaign <coughs> about this. We really need to move the needle. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tura. And on your last point, Minister, she says we should have a campaign and move the needle. Now, I think the brains are here to have that campaign and to begin to begin to put those plans together for a campaign of that nature. Do you agree with me? Yes. The brains are here. So, Ms. Tura, let's take you up on that. And let's put a call to action to everybody who is in the room and those who may not uh, also be in this room to actually work on that. Because I think it's important. If you tell a compelling story and you build, you put together a, a proper business case, there is no way that we will not be able to, to get through on this. And I think it's important. I think it's a brilliant call to action. You know, Mastura, one thing I want to do is, um, Minister, I want to acknowledge those committed uh, bureaucrats. And there are two in the room. There are three and two of them. One is not here, but there are two in the room. Wiseman, if you could stand, and Salman Jehoma. These are two people who have played a significant role, stand Wiseman, in this piece of work for many years ago. Uh, Mastura for a second. Uh, so, so these are, uh, there's a word that you use, there's a word that, not, um, what do you how, how do you say they're old but they're not old? Uh, something of that nature. So these guys have, legends. legends, that's the word, have played a significant role in terms of uh, working on significant pieces of work on social protection in this country. And uh, Minister, let me say to you, one of them said to me this morning, my brother, if ever you need a job, come to me. We'll work together. We'll make it happen. I won't tell you which one. I won't tell you which one. Uh, but thank you very much. And I think... Um, <laughs> I will tell you which one. But thank you very much, uh, Mastura and Doc, for those brilliant remarks. Um, I think it's, 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 really, it's really, really useful. At this point in time, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to stand as we welcome the Minister of Social Development to come and deliver a keynote address for us on this very important topic. Could you put your hands together for her? Thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Can I hold the mic? I must put it on here. Yeah, uh, I can hold it. I can hold it. Can you hold it? Um, thank you very much. Uh, ver it's still morning, hey? Yes. Yeah, it's still morning. Um, thank you so much. I actually requested the DG to do a juggle a little bit on the program because I think that some of the people who are still to speak and those that are going to be asking questions, it's not right for them to be asking questions when they have even haven't heard what I say, in case they have much more questions uh, to ask me and the department and, and everybody else. Firstly, can I have a copy? Yeah, can I? No, just the, 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 the summary, please. I've, I've got a piece of work, and here I'm only just having um, the summary. The other day we were, where were we going, Brenda? We were going to Durban. And uh, I had uh, the bigger one, and she said, hey, how come you're reading the bigger one? There's a summary. And then I said, no, I've already gone through the summary, and I think there are some facts and figures that uh, uh, we need to put right in our heads, because if we do so, and as we walk around and we go to different places, you have to do proper reference. So this is the reason why we're here, and this is just the um, summary, and please get a copy. And uh, we, we're here also for you who are in the room to get the copy, because this is hard work to put facts, uh, figures, and do research. Um, it's not an easy thing, and um, 
having been a student myself, I'm hoping that some of the young people who are here might want, as the acting DG said earlier on, they might want to do their thesis and a whole range of other work, picking it up from here. When I was a student, uh, my final thesis was um, on the media coverage of the youth revolt and revolution of 1976. And that's what I did, and, and, and by the way, I didn't do it in English, I did it in Russian, which was the most difficult. I had to go to libraries to go and get information about it, and unfortunately at that time, it was very hard to get that information because between the Soviet Union then and South Africa then and the isolation of South Africa made it very difficult. So I would ask people who would be traveling to London or, or Paris and so please bring some more information for me because it's easily accessible. So to the young people in the room, you have to do it in English and it's the simplest. We have to Google, which is the simplest. At that time, there was no Google. Uh, or, or you can, whatever. In today's time, it's easier to do. So it's an encouragement for me uh, that the Department of Social Development, and I, I really want here um, to say Brenda Brenton, who's now not with uh, us, is with uh, Social Development, Selwyn, Maureen, Wiseman, everybody who took it upon themselves to say, yes, we are a department, but we cannot be able to do the work on our own. We will go out and get some people to help us with this. So I said to the DG, allow me to just speak quickly because there's a lot of um, information that has passed through and um, in these days, information comes through and goes out very fast so that we enable people to continue recalling the information and ask, um, the questions. So to everyone who is here today uh, from the Nelson Mandela Foundation, to UNICEF who's still going to be speaking, and thank you very much my sister, you are always with us uh, all the time, uh, to Totsi Mamela who's spoken, to all the senior managers of government, department, entities, and all, I wish to thank you for having carried this work which in my view is work that has to help us in shaping the policies that we are yet um, to do, but also in reviewing um, what we have done uh, in the past. And I wish to thank the presenters uh, because every one of you who's here could feel and see and hear that this was a very good uh, piece of work that was done. And as you were busy presenting, I was looking at um, the picture of uh, the late Nelson Mandela. I was like, yo, he's looking that way. Then I thought, no, he's looking at the work that we are presenting there. <laughs> so so uh, I think that um, this work really falls under a very, very important unit in the Department of Social Development, Comprehensive Social Security. But this is what I've been saying um, to Brenda in particular and, and the other Sibego. Thank you very much for this. And by the way, guys, that's a young, bright mind working in Parliament. So let there be no undermining of the work that is done in Parliament because there we've got a lot of young, bright mind researchers who are supportive of all the different uh, uh, committees uh, of Parliament. This, for me, is empowering to the younger generation and I'm saying to them, you allow people to let, let you look that way when everybody's going that way. Because whether you like it or not, this country is moving to the next level. And for those of us who always find them ourselves in international platforms, and we are asked questions, and we are responding, and we have um, the political support, I can tell you there was a, a talk about political willingness, and they know, I always say to them, the political willingness without the administrative support and the administrative support that does not work because they have to get salaries. They work because they understand the state of the people. 
they understand the challenges that are being faced by our people. If you don't have uh, 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 people in your office or in a department that do not put themselves in the shoes of those who are not as privileged as they are, then you don't belong to the department. And as far as I'm concerned, I've worked with everyone in the past four years, and I've always said to them, as you do everything you do, just think of the people you left at home. Because here's the bottom line, the majority of the people who are in the de department, come December, they get into their fancy cars and they go to Limpo, Pompumalanga, KZN, and all those places. And I say to them, as you do so because you are privileged, please don't go there and be fancy to those people because you are bringing this huge uh, uh, Christmas food and everything. Remember that you'll go there, you'll come back, and they'll be asking you to send them money for, just for impoop, me a milli mil. So my approach to, um, to the responsibility that was given to me and to the deputy minister is simple. We came into a department on the basis of people that had done a lot of work before us. You can talk of Zola Square everywhere you go. You get the sense that you had somebody that had told himself, I've been given this responsibility and I'll make it happen. So we're here today even dealing with this child poverty and child support grant. Brenda and them drummed it into my head for me to understand food poverty line, child food poverty line, upper bound, lower bound, uh, food poverty. And in the beginning, I thought, am I ever going to get this one? <laughs> Let me tell you, I got it. <laughs> and I got it, and um, getting it is what has made it not extremely difficult for me to dance with the Minister of Finance. And, and, and getting it and understanding it is what has made it easy for me to dance with each and every cabinet member who has to appreciate this. Why do I say this? I say so because I believe this that we're dealing with here is not something that can be dealt with only by the Department of Social Development. We need to create a conducive environment for our people, period. Yes. And creating a conducive environment for our people is starting with the conditions under which they live. The transport, the economy, the health, the education, and that's why I say to you, since they started making me sing that song, I'm able to dance with anybody who comes my way. And what is the dance about? The dance is simple and straightforward. How do we move, change the lives of our people for them to be able to stand on their own two feet and say, I can do this. I've got this, without having to be begging and pleading and doing that. But at the same time, let us also understand that these people we are talking about, they are not living in mass somewhere. They live with us on a day-to-day basis. Do we see them? That's the issue. Do we see them? Do we feel them? Do we understand them? Do we appreciate and understand that the roles and responsibilities that have been given to us are here to reflect on social policy challenges that the majority of children and youth are encountering in communities throughout the country today? We must not remiss of the elaborate institutions. You know, <laughs> when I talk about the elaborate institutions of the past, can I not be misunderstood deliberately? When I talk about, not only me, it was said here, about what apartheid did, its partial development, its throwing us in the dungeons, in keeping us in places where there was nothing that is happening. I'm not saying that and we are not referring to that because we don't want people to ask us about the questions of what we have done today. We as government must consistently and continuously explain what is it that we have done today. And those, uh, uh, I, I always have this thing in my head and I, I think in life I need to be assisted also uh, to transform into the new. Because 
I grew up with a grandfather who lived in Johannesburg and he did nothing but live in the hostel for more than 50 years. I was brought up by a grandmother who was nothing but a domestic worker. And those two made sure that their eight children will come out of poverty by ensuring that they go to school. And my grandmother said, I'm not educated, but I'm educated in what I learned when I was a domestic worker. I don't want any one of you to ever be a domestic worker. I don't want any one of you to be what your grandfather or your father, or my father was a little bit better. He went to school, finished school. And so my grandmother and my grandparents wanted the change from this that was said by Fervut some years ago. He said, what is the use of teaching the Bantu child mathematics when it cannot use it in practice? And then some people think today that should have been just changed easy like that when my mother, my, okay, my father was very different. When others could not go, I'm saying he was different because he went to school and he finished school, he went to St. Augustine's fancy school because my grandparents could uh, try and put something together. He played cricket, but he never could reach anywhere in that cricket, no matter how much he loved it, because the system said, you are black, you cannot go any forward. So I want us today to appreciate and understand that the mandates that came in 1994 it was a mandate that came through the blood, sweat, and tears of many who today, I can stand here and be proud that I'm standing here, but I can tell you I left many of them in graves all over the world. They look at us and they say to us, are we going to feel this comfort that we live in ourselves because we are privileged, as you rightfully said, you earn a salary and so forth? I don't think we should live in our own comfort within ourselves. We should live in the comfort of what we are doing to make the change uh, for our people. So a number of points have been indicated there. Uh, for instance, that from the point forward of 1994 and the constitutional mandate and the constitutional responsibility, uh, from that point, Every child was constitutionally guaranteed to enjoy the right to be provided with a nutritional food and social assistance where their families were, were unable to support them. It is for these reasons that since 1994 and every administration of the African National Congress has comprehensively been strengthening the implementation and accessibility of social assistance for millions of South Africans who are unable to provide for themselves. We are nowhere near where we should be. Brenda and them, they know. We had the white paper and the green paper and all that on comprehensive social security. And every time we lift it so that you know, maybe you might want to do some research also on this. Why is it that we have this comprehensive social security that has been developed by the Department of Social Development and a whole range of other people, but every time we put it on the table, somebody stands up to say, no, it can't work. You need to find out who is it that's saying, no, it cannot work, and why can't it work? And that's why I'm happy that here we have civil society organization, activists, people who are going to be able to pick that up and say, if we want our people to live in a better South Africa, that social comprehensive plan that we have, and by the way, that plan is not just for poor people, that plan is for everybody. And here as South Africans and those of us who are privileged and maybe in the middle class, <laughs> I walk around and I'm like, yeah, it's okay, but here's fact. The middle class has been uh, uh, lifted and we've got more numbers. But go ask them, the house they live in is their house. The clothes they wear, can they really say, yeah, this, I don't use a credit card to go and buy this. The food that they eat, can they say, I live according to my means? Can they say, 50 years from now, where they are, they will go and retire with good retirement? These are the things that we need to ask ourselves uh, in particular. And so this work that has been done here, 
Um, and I don't want to go into all because I think you covered many of the things that I could have covered in as far as my speech is concerned. And the child support grant in particular, the research that we have done, child support grant impact assessment report, it highlighted a number of things that we have said here. And you've referred to SASA and the work that has been done by SASA. Let me tell you one of the reasons why I think um, we should be able to work with each other. This responsibility of bringing up the child is about empowering the parents, the grandparents, the community, and I say to the department, you've got to be able to do it house to house, street to street, community to community. Because if you are going to think about it only at the top, go deep down and that's when we are going to be able to then say what are the future uh, plans that you need to have and I think that having research being done numbers don't lie unless you are in some countries where they decide okay the numbers are here they are they are not going according to what we want we're going to shift them I'll tell you here in South Africa I've been here since 1994 I've been in government and I've been out of government I've been in Brazil I've been all that if there's one thing I love about this country when stats SA puts it up there you like it you don't like it tough luck that is fact. And if you can't work and believe in fact, then you are wasting your time. So the, the work that we have here, which has been done, is work in my view that's going to enable us to look into uh, the future. Here is one also takeaway for me, which is very important. COVID-19, somebody said, uh, you might, it's, it's not nice to say it was COVID-19 that pushed us into certain decisions that we made. It's not nice, but it's fact. And I'm feeling like now we are slowly moving away from that. We are now feeling comfortable because, again, us here who are privileged are now not threatened by COVID-19. The people that work in our fancy homes are not going to bring COVID anymore, so we are not concerned about it. There's a lot of good things that happen and decisions that were taken by government at the time, whether it's with regard to the SRD uh, 350, whether it was the money that was added uh, to the child support grant and all that, all that enabled us. And I think that uh, now it is like, no, we are on a fiscal cliff and what the issue is. Can we afford not to lift our communities? Can we not can we afford not to have this child, this child who's growing in a different environment, in a different world, in a challenging world, the child who's growing in a world where during our time of liberation struggle, the world was waiting for us and it was helping us. The world can't be bothered with us right now. The world is competing with us. Can we afford to have a child who will not be able in the future to withstand the challenges of the world? Because South Africans, can we stop being narrow about ourselves? Can we also think of the fact that we belong to the broader world? And if we belong to the broader world, this research work that has been done, what does this work say to SADC region? What does this work say to the continent? What does this work say to all the, the international obligations that we have? What does it say? So for me, as I conclude, I wish to thank you all um, for, for the good work that has been done and also thank the people who uh, not only are here because they just want to be here, they are here because I can guarantee you they'll take that piece of work Go look into their own areas of work and then say, how do I use this to impact and make the change on the work that I am doing? And the 10-year review of the NDP is very critical for us. I've already said to the department, can you go inside there and see what is it that has been done by the Department of Social Development? And lastly, I've said to them, it's 30 years of democracy.
Can we go back and can you produce as a department? What is it that you as a department have done in the 30 years to make an impact and change on the lives of our people? And if you find that you haven't done much, which I think is the case, we, we are not yet there, please, can you look at what the next 30 years is going to look like? I don't work on the basis of the now. I know that the people out there, they, we need to respond to the, the felt needs of the people now. But it's our responsibility to go to them and say, the past 30 years, from where were, were we lifting ourselves? But what should be the next 30 years look like? And what should a 30-year-old who is born today, 30 years down the line, say? When they pick up this document and they read it, when they look at all the things that government did to change their lives, that 30-year-old must not speak the same language of the 30-year-old today. And to the young people of today, please don't be dragged by other people into spaces that are unnecessary. This country is yours, and it can only be built by you. This country, 30 years back, when there was Soweto uprising and all, there were people who stood up like uh, uh, the CEO of Sasa here says, uh, I had a child, but I didn't bring that child up. One day somebody must ask her what actually happened. So those children of that time, of 40 years ago, they were young, 12, 13, 14, 50 year olds. They took a decision, we shall change this life in South Africa. So the 30 year old of today must then say, Come the next 30 year old tomorrow must not live the same life as, I, as, as I'm living. And as I conclude, please allow me to invoke the words of President Nelson Holisatla Mandela when he said, and I quote, we do not want freedom without bread, nor do we want bread without freedom. We must provide for all the fundamental rights and freedoms associated with a democratic society. And this, it's not only for government to do, it is for all of us to do, including the researchers, who will go and do the research, tell us the facts, give it to us the way it is, and we must not be afraid, Brenda, of responding to what they've said right now. I thank our partners, the Children's Institute, UNICEF, and Nelson Mandela Foundation for uh, enabling us for, uh, for us to be here uh, today, uh, for being with us throughout this review, and thank you for your un, uh, in, an invaluable support at all times. This country is going to be what we fought for. This country is going to be what the people of South Africa want it to be, but we cannot run too fast and leave them behind. We must work with them. Thank you. That's a, good, that's a good place to say amen. Yeah. <laughs> I almost said it's, a, it's also equally a good place to say Amanda. <laughs> Thank you very much, Minister. Really thought-provoking inputs um, and really useful, really just to bring it together and harness a number of inputs that have been made here this morning. Uh, and again, really talking to fundamental issues around political will, what the government has done. Uh, but most importantly, most importantly, looking at the future ahead of us. Because it's your children, our children, and our children's children who will ask us, what did we do when we sat in these positions, when we sat in these places, when we had this knowledge, this information? What did we do to create a better life for them in the future? So we have to be futuristic, we have to be innovative uh, in everything that we do, and we must never stifle growth and development. Never. Never. So, thank you very much, Minister. Much appreciated. Uh, we're almost there, ladies and gentlemen. We're almost there. Somebody's looking at their watch and saying, you know what, it's 12 o'clock now. I'm supposed to have taken my tablets, but I can't take tablets without eating lunch. No problem, lunch is on its way. I can guarantee you. So, thank you very much. Now, I'm going to ask, th there, are, there are one or two things I'd like to do. Firstly, I'm going to ask that if you have a burning question, not input, question. We'll get to inputs later. If you have a burning question that you'd like to ask the researchers uh, or even the minister around the work that we've just done, if you have a question, the rule is that you can't go longer than a minute in asking your question. Anybody? Madam?
please introduce yourself. Uh, and once you've introduced yourself, indicate what your question is. If you could pass this to the back, please, sir. Um, and I'll be timing you to make sure that you don't go beyond a minute in asking your question. So if you want to add a preamble, etc., it must be within that minute. Please introduce <laughs> yourself. Thank you. I'm Pimelo from Rural Health Advocacy Project and the Budget Justice Coalition. So my question is about rural communities and the type of s the unique challenges that they have. I think um, we were hoping that um, in the future, one of the recommendations would be um, having a, like the grant being more for people that are in rural communities because of their unique challenges. I mean, if somebody is, okay, and I, I'll, I'll just keep it short. If somebody is in rural Limpopo, they would need to pay 60 rand just to go to their nearest town, just to get that finance. Um, that grant that they need to buy the groceries. So can uh, in future, ca can that be um, incentivized? Thank you. The researchers. The researchers, okay. Yes. Rural communities. Uh, and what do we do in that space? I <laughs> saw a hand uh, next. Uh, Madam, let's take the gentleman in front of you first, and oh. then we'll go to the gentleman Just at the back. In front Just in front of you. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Thanks, thanks so much. Daniel McLaren, a public finance economist at Lifa Labantwana. I just want to say thank Didn't you I so see much. you on TV sometime two days ago? Yeah. Yesterday. Yeah, yes, yesterday. Yes, yeah. New Newsroom <laughs> Africa. Um, <laughs> we've done a, a bit of modeling on a maternity support grant, um, uh, which has shown that uh, um, just in this uh, context of incrementalism, um, a two billion rand increase to the budget um, for social development grants um, uh, targeting a maternity support grant, which is essentially um, bringing the child support grant forward into the pregnancy period um, and closing gaps in access to the CSG once a child is born. Um, that could actually increase the reach uh, by about 700,000 women um, accessing this grant. So I just wanted to ask the researchers um, if you had factored that into any of your um, yeah, forward-looking forward options. A very useful question, and I would encourage you with Anthony do you know where he disappeared to? Anthony, where is he sitting? I saw him just now. He's disappeared. I'd encourage you to have a conversation um, with Anthony and Maureen and Brenda. Uh, significant work that they've put together on that. But uh, as always, we get blocked somewhere. I won't tell you where. Okay. Um, <coughs> we have to dance in sync, you know. Um, yes, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Stanley Malamaja from the Center for Child Law. Um, at the University of Pretoria. Um, thank you very much uh, to the researchers for such an amazing uh, piece of work. Um, my question is to the researchers. Um, I think uh, speaking on the legal aspects, um, you spoke about the nature of the right uh, to basic nutrition in that it is immediately realizable. And you also spoke about the justiciability nature of the right. So my question is, when you were doing this research and when you started um, um, discovering the poverty lines that um, children are living below, are you, or during your research, do you anticipate that there might be litigation that comes out of this? Because basically your, your research shows us that there's a fundamental violation of the right to basic nutrition. So are you anticipating <laughs> litigation? Uh, so, so just to say that my brother there from CCL uh, is also one of the institutions that we have a love-hate relationship. Love Quite it. often we get letters saying, uh, "Well, we're taking you to court, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. So, that. so uh, <laughs> the unique thing about this session, my brother, is that uh, here we are seeking to forge partnerships, and the idea of seeking to forge partnerships is not to fight. Not to argue, not to take each other on, blah, blah, blah. We all have our respective responsibilities and what we have to do, right? Mandates, etc. cetera. Um, so um, we're partners here, you know? <laughs> we're partners. <laughs> I'm just saying. OK, one last question, and I would have preferred it to come from, let's take a question here. Mm, yeah. I see you there, my brother. Uh, OK, but we're running out of time. So let's go there. And then let's take the question here. And the last question by the female, by my sister there, then we're good. Thank you. Thank you so much, DG. Dumelang, uh, everyone. Dumelang, everyone. From my Startup Foundation. 
Uh, you ask us to uh, speak for one minute, but as a starter in person, I really need more time, my brother. I start a foundation, is a foundation from the Free State. Yeah. Uh, the researchers, I just want to check with you guys if you guys are aware of an invisible disability. Uh, this month is International Stuttering Awareness Month. The 22nd is International Stuttering Awareness Day. It's not being celebrated in Africa, whereas uh, stuttering people are close to 10 million in Africa. Not a uh, single country in Africa celebrates the day. Uh, a Stutter Foundation has been working with the Department of Education in the Free State, where we go around schools since 2017. But in the last four months, we have been trying to expand in Gauteng. With the help of social media, radio, TV, there's been an outcry in this province uh, where people would just always call us. So uh, in a month, one week we're in the Free State, one week we're in Gauteng now, trying to help uh, people this side. There are a whole lot of people who are stuttering, who are going through a lot every single day, even at workplaces. HR people don't know about stuttering that when you call me for an interview, um, I cannot really express myself that like uh, a normal speaking person. The researchers, please help uh, the stuttering, or please help Nzanzi to recognize the stuttering. It is an urgent matter. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And that's a very important input. And I would like to suggest again, my brother, that you also have a conversation with the Department of Social Development. Uh, and let's see how we can work together to that end. Yes, uh, I already met with the Honourable Minister last year, so uh, yeah, my, my question went to the researchers. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Much sir. appreciated, Bob. Thank you. Okay, let's pass the mic down to my sister here, and then we'll end uh, with uh, Mr. Micah there. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Kinsu Khadebe from the DG Murray Trust. And again, thank you to the researchers that have pulled this together. I think my question is to the researchers and also maybe to the minister, because I think I sort of went to the end of the report and just quickly read through the recommendations when I got a hold of the book and I thought to myself, okay, that sounds pragmatic, um, but I think a lot of the conversations that we've been having today have been around the lack of political will on these political issues. And I think for me, Minister, when you're engaging with Treasury, um, for those of us who are sitting in different rooms, how do we support your work? Yeah. Um, how do we galvanize action around yeah. the critical issues that we've raised here? Because I think it's clear that this is an urgent issue, but in the room we're probably preaching to the converted. So who isn't in the room? Who needs to hear this message? Thanks. I think we're building a committee already, Mustad, um, uh, Mastura. As you can see, uh, we have uh, a good candidate to be part of that committee that we're building together in terms of addressing the call to action. Thank you very much, my sister. Yes, sir. Thank you, DJ. Um, looking at the work that has been presented here, one can tell that there is a lot of work that has gone into it. And um, the biggest question that I have, well, part of the report is the recommendation part uh, the recommendations are actually proposing some action to be taken to ensure that the benefits of the work that has been done are realized. The question that I would have would be directed to the Honorable Minister, and the question is, what are the chances of the recommendations being implemented to achieve the purpose of the work that has been done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Much appreciated. I'm going to take one last hand because we are building a friendship and a partnership with Black Sash. So I'm going to allow them to speak. Um, thank you, madam. Over to you. Can we pass the mic on? Yeah, I'm just to give you my own mic. One, I think it, it's a follow-up to, to my fellow colleague, Yang, uh, with regards to the working in silo. In all these instances where we come across the Department of Social Development, uh, you would find that DSD is carrying quite a lot of, of responsibility. 
in, in this room, one would have expected, I mean, so, some of the inputs that came from the report speaks to issues or, or that speaks to identification, like your, your documentation. It speaks to issues that directly taps on health, and uh, it speaks, yes, where the, the back stops, your treasure. They're not here. That's very worrying, because we are, it's like we're talking to the converted Department of Social Development. You are making all strides to, to, to reach out. Where are the other departments? Why I'm saying then to the minister is, I think, hence I'm saying it's a follow-up. How do we support that at the end of the day? All the other ministers, whether there is a social class um, uh, uh, thingy, how, how do we support that the, the other government, uh, government departments, they don't work in their own, because they are cushioned now. You speak uh, 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 identification or, or documentation. They, they are less concerned. It came up. 2020, there was that uh, stagnation in terms of registration, which has an impact to a, a department that we will definitely knock at. But the effect is not necessarily from this department. It's from another department. So I think what I'm actually making inputs to not necessarily a question is let's find a way of how we get everybody else, not only from a political will, because this is a constitutional matter, really. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. There are five questions for the researchers and two for the minister. I would suggest we start with the researchers. Um, and I've promised everyone in this room, researchers, hint, hint, that we'll be out of here in the next 30 minutes. I still have four more people who need to speak after this. So I'm just saying this to everybody uh, who's going to make input. Oh. So let's be as swift as oh. possible. Yes, within 30 minutes, oh. we'll be out of here. Four people were going to speak to you after this. Very briefly. Thank you. Uh, you still have your mic on? No? Oh. Okay. You just use that. Oh, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, great questions. I'm, ju I'm just going to uh, I'll start with Pamela. Yes, it's a really, you, you, um, Okay, the thing is the rural ch challenge and whether to have a, a, a bigger increase for... We, this was one of the things we considered when we were looking at the modelling. We didn't have to go, oh, and you could phase in by age. We're thinking, how else could you target it? And targeting is a really important question. So firstly, what is the, what is the rationale for it? We've got very high levels of poverty in rural areas. Also, whereas social grants used to be... The cash payments used to go to villages. They don't anymore. People have got to travel in order to get them. So that's a huge issue. Then we had to think about, um, okay, uh, in terms of poverty levels, is that, a, is that a justifiable way to target a bigger grant? Actually, we're seeing rising urban poverty um, as well. We can't say the poor are all in the rural areas. Um, and when we see urban poverty statistics, we've got to remember that those are the average of very unequal incomes. So you've got very extreme poverty in urban areas. So we wouldn't do it on that basis. The, 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 the issue of travel is a, is a huge one. And that's actually part of why the means test was different originally as well. There was a, a different means test for rural areas. We didn't do it because of um, a logistical issue. We talked about some of the conditions that happened at the beginning, things you had to prove in order to be able to get the grant. Now, frankly, I did my whole PhD on migration and mobility, like labor migration and what happens to children. I'm fast, people move around. Yeah. And at that point we realized area-based targeting is not really a viable option because it will create obstacles for people. They will have to prove where they live. How do you do that? They will have to stay in the same place, but actually children often move between households. So for this reason, we didn't model it. Um, I'm not saying it's not viable, and maybe it's something to think about. But but just to say that they're always, when you know, when one thinks of targeting, it does require an element of proof, which can be very hard and can backfire. Um, um, I think Paul is going to talk to your question, Daniel. But yes, um, great, and actually, yeah, and and big. I mean, combinations of things are important. We've talked about comprehensive social security and how these things fit together. Um, do me, um, thank you, and respect. Um, and I'm glad that the DSD has also extended uh, 
an invitation to come and speak to them and we also would be happy to speak to you. It's not something we have done work on, but and there may be other people who are better, but let's think about what research you want. And, uh, Kenzie, who's not in the room? Whew. Okay, so can I just say, you said at the beginning, you, you, the two ca categories were not here, and treasury is an important one. So let's just clarify that they were invited, a bunch of people from treasury, the Department of Home Affairs, also absolutely integral to this. And also, actually interesting, they're setting up a new office on the rights of the child in the presidency. They're not here, but they are doing over overview work now on, on child poverty. So yes, there are many people who are not in the room. That doesn't mean they're not going to get this report, and we have to take it um, to Treasury. And maybe, and, and the interesting thing is when you think of going to Treasury, I go, oh great, because then I can put in lots more tables and all the numbers that I couldn't get presented today, because that's what they're interested in. But actually, part of what they need to hear is the other stuff, the, the stories and the rationale, and we've got to get good at doing that. Um, yeah, I think, um, yeah, the question from Issa, I think maybe the minister can respond to, what happens after this? Um, and, um, yeah, okay, let me hand over to Paula for the rest. Thanks. Okay, so Stanley, your question, are we anticipating litigation? Answers, no, we're not. Too busy with other litigation of other departments? <laughs> and, well, no, not you guys, because you, you see, if you, w what's, what's quite unique about the Department of Social Development and SISA is the openness and the engagement, you know, so if we can continue to talk and to understand each other's constraints and um, debate and disagree, then we are inching forward. Okay, and I, I would appeal to you to talk to your home affairs colleagues and your treasury colleagues on how to engage with stakeholders. <laughs> because those colleagues are, yeah, they, they need to learn how to engage. <laughs> um, but I, I, can't, I can't guarantee that another civil society organization is not going to litigate around the right to basic nutrition. Okay, so it is a litigation risk that sits there. Um, then um, the minister raised also the question around this enduring problem of stunting, and I, and I think it's also linked to this rising urban pol um, poverty and also the rural problems. You know, at the Children's Institute, we also we work on a number of issues, and one of those is birth registration. And we've seen an increasing number of children without birth certificates. Um, particularly in your rural areas. You go to any of the, the schools in the rural areas around in Taita, long lists of children without birth certificates. And those children then struggle to get the grant. Um, they can get the grant, but it's a struggle to get the grant. And we've seen this as a growing problem. Um, and this also links back to Daniel's question around the maternity support grant. Imagine you had a system where you load your, your pregnant mom onto your SASA system in the second trimester. You register her, she's ready. She either gets the MSG or even if you're just waiting for her to get the CSG, you've loaded her on. She knows she needs to get her ID ready. She knows she needs to have all her other documents ready to get her birth certificate. The birth of the baby, Home Affairs is there in the hospital, the birth certificate is issued. Home Affairs tells SASA, birth certificate online, we've got it, SASA presses a button, CSG starts. Imagine that, okay? And I know that there's a lot of people in the room who would be interested in something like that. Um, and I've been talking to a lot of people and actually that idea comes from all those people. Um, so I think, you know, we have, we could put those two ideas together um, to address a lot of problems. Stunting, uh, rural problems around birth registration, um, the under ones, the low uptake for the under ones. Who's next? Brilliant. It's Thank you very much. It's uh, me it's next Minister, quickly. Yes. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll start with the, the question about what happens from here. Um, what happens from here is not to take this uh, research and put it in our shelves yeah. and forget about it. That's just the, 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 the thing I can say because if you look at the basic income grant, which Brenda and them and others during uh, Zolasco year's time and the Taylor Committee and everything that they did, <coughs> the work was done and it was put somewhere in the shelves. And again, as COVID-19 
when we were asking the question, what happens after the 350? What happens at the end? They said, ah, Minister, there is a document. Your own government ha uh, made sure that we have this document. I said, pull it out. It is here now. It's on the table, and it's been appreciated in a number of quarters, and I'm not going to let it go. And I don't want the department to let it go, because I know at some point when the questions were being asked, the media then, when we started, they said, ah, you just uh, blowing hot air. I was not, not because I was looking for anything. It is because the 350 had put on the table what it meant for people. And therefore, sustainability thereof of the 350 itself, but something much more stable and something that we can always know it's there. Uh, so we're not going to put this uh, research in our in our in our um, shelves or anything of that sort. And the reason why the the the, the you have civil society and others that's why they keep us on, keep us on our toes. Yeah. They're going to consistently be asking me what happened. I must be able to say this is what has happened. And the other issue that I want to quickly respond to is with regard to the silos, which remain a problem uh, in government. Um, and, and I personally think that they must end. And the only way that they can end is, can we have some uh, places of excellence where people can refer and say, look at the department of this, look at the department of this. It's always are connecting uh, to other people. And let's work together as government, because as I earlier on said, we, are, we have the political will. It's got to be supported by the administrative will, because we as ministers, we meet all the time. And the officials, unfortunately, sometimes they sit in their little corners. And they're not like us where we are forced by either belonging to certain clusters where you have to go to the cluster meeting, or you, you belong to cabinet, you have to go to cabinet. So we see each other more often collectively than the officials do. So we must get that to brush over um, to the officials, but we must also take our responsibility of the executive in ensuring that that changes. Part of the reasons why we have monitoring, planning, monitoring, and evaluation, it was a recognition of um, the fact that we've got lots of things that are sitting in different corners. Can we have a center that can crack the whip? And I can tell you, monitoring and evaluation cracks the whip on us in many instances, but they're still not strong enough because I don't think they, they have resources, human and otherwise. And monitoring and evaluation shouldn't be something that sits at national. It should be something that sits national, provincial, right down to local, and they must coordinate because once government says, this year, this is the plan, everybody has got an annual plan. How do we make sure that those annual plans are interrelated, interconnecting? And then even the annual plans, monitoring and evaluation must say, if you don't have the budget, how are you going to implement it? Then we must go and have the dance with the Minister of Finance and, and the department to say, if it's not funded, it will not work. Same thing as what is being presented here. If it's not going to be funded, it will be a story in Tso and again, I just want to get work going. And the rural communities, I think that has been answered, but I still think that we are not waking up to the reality of the current challenges of rural challenges of infrastructure, of education, of clinics, and all that. And I think government is very much aware of that. That's why we say, let us strengthen the provincial and local structures, because national is, is strong. You know what we did when we came into government? We, we took everybody to national and forgot that we need to strengthen the local uh, structures. And I think we've woken up to that, um, and we're going to be able to um, to deal with it. I think I've, I've covered most of the, the questions. Well, well, I like this one of the maternal support, because I was just saying here that, um, well, I say to the department, I've been telling them, for all who care to know, I say, guys, we deal with, um, uh, 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 cradle to grave. Mm. And I say to them, no, let's deal with before the cradle. Because there are some people who come together for one reason or the other and they say, they don't even discuss the fact that they are going to have a child. They just go there and do what they have to do. The next thing is the woman who is pregnant in a very difficult environment because she does not decide. 
she decides on the basis of the time. But we are not doing something to say pre. What do we say to the young man? What do we say to the young girl? What do we say to the parents? So that by the time they decide that they're going to have a child who has to be taken care of by themselves, and then the state also comes in, they would have been empowered before then. What we have is they are not making that informed decision. If we can then take it back and say creation of a conducive environment for communities about empowering them to have the right decision, I'm like, don't give communities information that goes above their heads. Give them information that will help them to make the decisions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. And thank you to everybody uh, who's responded and provided input for that. Uh, and I think that this is, you know, this is very useful. I wish we had more time. Um, but we don't have more time, but uh, in um, exactly what Mastudo started talking about and my colleague there and a few others that are beginning to latch on, we have to have some sort of call to action post this meeting. It shouldn't be that we just came, we met, we launched, we ate nice food and then we left. It should be that we came, we saw, we launched, etc. but we've put a mechanism in place to ensure that we're able to push this work forward, right? Right? Give the person next to you a high five and say, I'm part of that. Just say I'm part of that, <coughs> just to wake you up a bit. Now, let me, Minister, let me, um, let me do this. Let me indicate two things. One, I'm going to ask um, Mr. Micah Nkabinde uh, from Eswatini uh, to come. And by the way, this meeting, this engagement is being watched even as far as Geneva. I just got a message now that there are people sitting in Geneva watching you, so smile, you on television. Uh, <coughs> yes, you can wave, no problem. See, the nice thing is that the camera is facing me, so they can't see you, so I'll wave on, on your behalf. <coughs> As Mr. Nkabinde comes up, let me just share something with you quickly. Uh, please come up, sir. Earlier this year, exactly, I think it was about four months ago, if I'm not mistaken, and for those who care to know, uh, it's important, and media, this is also important for you. This department, <coughs> on behalf of the country, received an International Social Security Association Good Practice Award for Africa 2023. Guess what was it on? It was on the gradual extension of social security coverage to vulnerable children, the case of the child support grant. That's a good place to clap. And this was bestowed upon the department. The minister received the award in Abidjan uh, a few months ago because we are doing a significant piece of work on the continent and we were recognized across the continent when it comes to work around child support grant. So this, this is working. And of course we can do more. Can you imagine what we would get if we do more? We'll get an international global award as opposed to just an Africa award. But a uh, lot of significant work that the team is putting in. I'm immensely proud of the work that Maureen and Brenda and Brenton is not here and the other colleagues and the foundation that has been laid by the likes of um, the colleagues that I mentioned earlier. A lot more can happen. And uh, we can do a lot more. Uh, and we're grateful for the support that we receive from ISA. Right now, I'd like to give to Mr. Mike and Gabinde just for about five minutes to render a message of support to you. A little later in the program, I'll gloat a little bit more about some of the significant things that this department is doing and getting. Uh, wait for it. Mr. Gabinde. Thank you. Thank you, program, program director. Honorable minister and all, uh, all protocol observed. I'm not going to be long. It is clear that uh, time is against us. Nonetheless, on behalf of ESA, uh, Southern Africa Liaison Office, we would like to express our appreciation to the government of South Africa and the, in particular, the Department of Social Development for the good initiatives that they are taking to ensure that social security is extended to all. And the government is actually confirming its social responsibility, the social contract that it has with the citizens of the country. Now, ISA is the International Social Security Association. 
that is tasked with the responsibility to promote social security worldwide. And it has an office here in Southern Africa. I think it would be in order to say that uh, the department that has brought us together here today is the one that pioneered the hosting of the liaison office, the ESA liaison office here in South Africa, and they did an ex a, a, a sterling job. It is currently now hosted by the Eswatini National Provident Fund in Eswatini, and the job that we are doing as Eswatini, the spade work was all done by the Department of Social Security, so Social Development in South Africa. Now, in its endeavors to ensure that social security is provided throughout the region, it provides training, workshops, seminars to ensure that the social security administrators are empowered to ensure that the institutions are governed in a manner that is excellent, in a manner that has the beneficiaries, the members at the front of everything else. The gathering today is about the report that the researchers have, have done, which is an excellent report. It is so informative. It has uh, the, 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 the facts and figures. It has the findings, specific findings, and it has the recommendations. Now, this is talking about a sector that has for a very long time not been cared for the children. Children are part of society and a very critical part of society. It has already been said here that if that sector is not being cared for, we are actually sitting on a time bomb. So we are saying, uh, as ESA, Southern Africa, we appreciate the efforts that are being made by the Department of Social Development in South Africa, and we affirm our support for all the activities that uh, the department is doing, the government of South Africa is doing, to ensure that social security coverage is extended, uh, not only extended to uh, as large a coverage as possible, but also it is adequate. And the report that we are looking at today is actually talking to the two. How far are we going? Is it enough? And actually, if we look at what is happening here today, if it were to be implemented, this would actually answer a lot of issues. Social issues that we have as a country, social issues that we have as a region. Actually, the report that we have here is not only going to be used by the Department of Social Security, Social Development in South Africa, but it is for the region. We will use it as a reference point. I think many countries, and uh, institutions are going to take leave. Now, I think at this point, uh, it has already been mentioned that South Africa, the Department of Social Development, was given an award in Abidjan for the extension of the social grants. And we, as the ESA, Southern Africa, applaud the department for such efforts. Um, I think, as I said, I was not going to be long. All that we are saying is ESA, Southern Africa region, is in full support of the work that is being done by the Department of Social Depart De Development and is appreciated. We are very grateful. The engagements that have gone on here are a clear indication that this is, it couldn't have come at the right time. Let's have it implemented. I thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Much appreciated. Uh, let's give uh, Mr. Micah a hand one more time. <clears throat>
We just have one more speaker, and then I'll play a video message for you, and then we'll close off. I'd like my sister Christine to come up, and she's the country representative for UNICEF uh, in the country. Christine, last night we shared the stage with um, a few of your colleagues from uh, uh, UN Women uh, and uh, the Department of Social Development. <coughs> 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 Uh, yesterday evening uh, received uh, an award let me just say this uh, and it was an Accenture Award Minister for Women Empowerment in the Workplace within the category of government so we are one the only department that has champions on gender empowerment uh, in government and we received that award last night from Accenture and we're immensely proud of the work that we're doing on gender empowerment so we shared the stage with the colleagues from UN Women yesterday and um, my sister Christine uh, we have a wonderful relationship with UNICEF and I'd like her to Oh, okay. I was saying the Department of Social Development <coughs> in the Republic of South Africa received the Accenture Woman Empowerment in the Workplace Award yesterday. Uh, and uh, if you listen to 702, you would have heard Bongani Bingwa talking about it uh, this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Linton. Honorable uh, Minister for Social Development, Acting DG for Social Development, CEO uh, of, of SASA, uh, all senior officials of the Department of Social Development gathered here today. My colleagues um, from the Unis University of Cape Town uh, Children's Institute, uh, all partners uh, here, members of the media, uh, colleagues, a very good and beautiful day to you all. It is um, a, a true pleasure. Uh, I'm actually humbled to be able to uh, be with you in such an auspicious uh, space for, for dialogue um, to, to mark the release of this very important, uh, insightful report on child poverty and the uh, child support grant. The United Nations Children's Fund, uh, which I represent here in South Africa, really welcomes this report and its findings that can further refine uh, our collective focus our priorities to improve the lives and well-being of the most vulnerable children across South Africa. Research and evidence about the situation of children in South Africa is a vital driver to determine how we approach and tackle issues that we raise today. For example, um, we're very happy and honored to be working uh, with the Department of Social Development and uh, SASA to develop an, uh, an appropriate follow-up to findings from the exclusion error research on this child support grant. Some of the uh, issues were uh, uh, reminded to us here, and we're very happy to be able to work on following up on, on those findings. This launch today re-emphasizes the importance of this collective work. It helps all of us to identify barriers challenges, opportunities, and act on them. That's why, as UNICEF, we are so pleased to be able to support the work of the production uh, of, this, uh, of this report. We're very proud to be uh, associated with it, even if you know, in a small and, uh, and modest way. This child poverty uh, report also dovetails with the goal of achieving an expanded social security system uh, many have already uh, alluded to this today. It is to be inclusive, relevant, and adequate to meet children's needs. For example, the campaign to raise the level of the child support grant to the level of the food poverty line is just as important as it is to ensure that all qualifying children receive the child support grant. Let me commend uh, here the, the, the Department of Social Development and the University of, uh, of, Cape, of Cape Town's Children's Institute on this thorough and thought-provoking uh, report. You know, many uh, people spoke passionately after they heard uh, what you had to say. And uh, again, we're very uh, happy to have been here to, to listen to what you had to say as well as uh, uh, the colleague who spoke before me. We will talk about uh, elsewhere, whenever we can, what is happening here in South Africa, because it's beautiful. Um, it is our wish that this report and the accompanying results are fully engaged with, as colleague was saying, we need a call for action coming out of here. 
that this research is given the platform that it deserves and that consequential changes are made to the social uh, grant system that supports children uh, in this beautiful country. Honorable Minister, colleagues, on behalf of the United Nations Children's Fund, uh, let me reaffirm our commitment to working with you in protecting, promoting, and supporting a stable and sustainable social protection system in this country. We owe it to all the children in this beautiful place. It's a moral obligation, uh, Honorable Minister. It is the right thing to do. And then, as it says here, it is the living, it is about living uh, the legacy that was uh, left to us by the, the person who, uh, who presides over this beautiful place. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, one thing about UNICEF, they are, you know you have those friends that you can always rely on. And then you have those friends that hey, you're never sure whether you can rely on them or not <laughs> because they will sometimes drop you at the last minute. One thing about UNICEF, they are one of those that are top of our list that we can always rely on. Always helpful, always come through, and we have a brilliant working relationship. Can we give my sister Christine a hand <laughs> just one more time? <coughs> Thank you very much. I'm going to play one video for you, two maybe, very short. Um, we're doing good, good with time. Uh, I want to um, play a message <coughs> uh, from Mr. Marcelo Abi Ramio, uh, Ramia uh, Caetiano, uh, who is the Secretary General of the International Social Security Association. Um, and um, it's a message of support, a short video message. I'd like you to listen to it. And. Is it, is, it, is it ready? This is not ready. <laughs> we'll get to that video after this. Can we play the message from Isa, from the Secretary General? Just pinch the person next to you and say, are you still here? Yeah. Just pinch them. <coughs> Just a short, small pinch. Lunch is around the corner. Pinch them awake, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Are we winning? My sister Isabella is getting ready to come and do the vote of thanks. Uh, so <coughs> you're delaying her. Uh, technical team at the back. Was this an informative session? Yes, Colleagues? Yes. Was it? Yes. Minister, let me say this while we're waiting for the video. And uh, Mastura's left now. I think she's just stepped out. Okay. <clears throat> and to all the colleagues around the room and the various players and partners, let me, let me say this, Brenda. <coughs> Brenda. Uh, Minister, I'd like to sponsor a roundtable conversation with all relevant stakeholders in this room around how we take this work forward. Um, and our commitment is that we'll have that roundtable conversation before the end of November. So we can gather together and find solutions practically how we can begin to work and take this work forward, uh, work together rather as a collective and take this work forward. Uh, I can guarantee you, Minister, they're not taking us to court. Uh, because we are working together in partnership, uh, CCL, <coughs> hint, hint. So, um, and that's what it's about. It's about partnership. Um, and we must pull together and be able to, to, to do this work. Yeah, is the challenge, I know it's recorded. Are we winning? They don't have it yet. Okay. Isabella, um, I want to acknowledge, though, that we do have a message um, yes, I do want to acknowledge that uh, Marcelo, actually we were with him in Dublin for the BRICS meeting last week, and he committed to do a video, a message of support, uh, and we appreciate the fact that he's done the message of support, and we acknowledge that message. We'll share it with everybody. It's actually on the ESA website as we speak. Uh, but you can play the other video as Isabella comes and does the vote of thanks. Okay. Good afternoon, colleagues.
Today, Minister Lindo Zulu will be launching the Child Poverty and Child Support Grant Review Report. The Child Grant reaches more than 13 million children and has been recognized as one of the best poverty alleviation programs in Southern Africa. We took to the streets of Soweto to find out how this grant is a lifeline for many, many children. So far, this is a kona logu ting ting impu pushuela amafu taleso shabo leso lelo langalen. Imali ake mento logu ti apunde skolo akube nge skolo aye pampili akono guza akoge nchenge singa ne achabud. And what would life be without this program of government? But would it ever be enough? Ish inga ni aye aye nzi next a a iya 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 zama la pisa makono pesha pesha. Sengulu mela gulo skatsa na mtanju gulo ya tura. Iko lo zona lezga hulu menzi bana matribu zifune logu zifune logu ma uniform. Is 1.2 for the graduation na mtana mdo mwani. So, masengzo ito li veli ambe yonke. I need guti kengize nyi kwa disele. Ngale 350 nyi to lai. Buzi guti. Nye mtana ma was guya kredu wa next year. Researchers from the University of Cape Town tell us the importance of this grant. The Child Support Grant is South Africa's most successful child poverty alleviation program. It currently reaches 13 million poor children in the country. And what it does is provide a basic amount of money, which at the moment is 500 Rand, to enable parents and caregivers to feed their children. When it first started in 1998, there were no children receiving this grant. After 10 years, it reached almost 11 million children. And over those 10 years, the rate of child poverty was reduced by 20 percentage points, from 53% to 33% children. And that represents millions of children who were brought out of food poverty by the Child Support Grant. Later, Minister Lindy Wazud will reveal the state of child poverty and she'll also tell us how the child support grant can be improved. Today, Minister Lindo Zulu will be launching the child. Wow, what a session. You know, it's one, one of its kind. And it just shows that we share a vision, we have a common goal, and we all have got passion, we've got commitment, and we want, you know, to change the life of our children. So, Minister has already said that this is not one of the reports that have been uh, developed, but it's one that we really have to action out. Now, as we move from here, it's about action. I mean, call for action first. Uh, DJ has already said that we need to have a round table dis a discussion where we map a, a way forward. After that is going to be action. Thirdly, it's going to be where we hold each other accountable because it is very much important we have spoken about us coming up with plans, but here, call for action, action, holding each other accountable. So um, I have no doubt because there's passion, you know, uh, in the sector about what we are talking about. Now, I want to really thank, I want to start with the, the host, Nelson Mandela Foundation. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Nelson Mandela Foundation for allowing us, you know, to hold this historic event in the historic place. Thank you very much. Uh, this is the continuation of our, our, our partnership. We started it in the past and we are continuing and will still continue. Thank you very much. 
I also want to thank, I'm not going to call people by name, I want to save time. I'm standing between you and your lunch. Yes. Now, I want to thank the researchers, all the researchers. We cannot do anything without you. You are the one who inform our policies. So it's, you are very much important. I want to thank the academia that are here. I want to thank the former colleagues, Dr. Magasela and Selwin Jehoma, who really made time to also be with us because they are the legend, as you, as you had. They started this process, and it's their baby, and they've got, you know, uh, the welfare of this baby at heart. They just don't want to see it growing. It's, it's very much encouraging, you know, to hear where we started. You know, I was really, really uh, touched to hear that we started, when we started, we had 400,000, you know, women and children receiving state maintenance grant. But now when we, we see where we are, we have grown up. Of course, we've got our own, you know, uh, challenges. We've got our own gaps. But at least we are reaching out to 13 million children. That in itself, we can give government a round of applause for that. There's a room for improvement, but we started there because men and women said and conceptualize it, and I'm, I'm, I want to know that it was not easy for them to be able, you know, to get it right. Conceptualization is very important because if you don't get it right at conceptualization, you won't be able to implement it. It's not going to be implementable. Hence, Dr. Magazella and Selwyn are very critical, and we really thank them and other colleagues who are, you know, uh, available at that at that time. We thank um, the Parliament Budget Office representative. Thank you very much for you know very informative and insight uh, presentation that uh, came out of that. The Medical Research Council. Thank you very much for the presentation. Representative from ISA. Wow, we are international. <laughs> wow, international. You know. So thank you very much, you know, for making this event, you know, taking it from one level to another level higher. Uh, we want to thank also other government departments. Mastura, thank you, you know, for coming and, you know, representing government and representing it so well. And we also want to thank um, our civil society organization. What can we be without them? You know, your NGO sector. I don't want to forget our... CCL, who are keeping us all on our toes. But I'm happy because they are also contributing effectively. They are not just, you know, uh, criticizing us, but they are also solution-oriented. Let's give them a round of applause for that. <laughs> Brenda, before I, I thank Brenda, let me see. Yeah, Brenda and team. Maureen and, and the team, and there are those maybe who are working, you know, uh, behind the scene. Thank you very much for putting up this uh, successful event. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Because some of, of us are here, you see we are dressed in black and white, but we don't know what it takes, you know, for us to be where we are. Thank you very much. CEO, thank you. The CEO of SASA, thank you very much. Uh, you are running a very big portfolio, and we thank you, you know, that you, you are also here and the acting CEO from um, NDA. Thank you, I saw her here. Digi, thank you very much. Uh, you said at the end of this program we must rate you, and that must be attached to your performance bonus. Um, I don't want to do it, <laughs> because people will say, because I also want to be given a bonus, because he's my boss, ne? <laughs> All right, um, I want also to thank I want to thank, yeah, I think I, no, no, I didn't thank all, all, of, all of the people I did. I, I actually did. But all, all, I want to finish, end up with the minister. You know, the woman who, who is carrying a vision and who shared the vision and who most of the time we frustrate her because sometimes we don't uh, stand up to the vision that she is carrying. And you heard her saying that, you know, he dan she dances with the co uh, co colleagues because she understands, you know, the vision, because she's passionate about the poor in the country or the people of this country. It's not only about the poor, but we as social development, we are dealing with everybody. 
It does not necessarily mean that when you are poor, you cannot have problems. You know that we've got the social ills that do not have any, any ch ch choice. All, all of us are affected by substance abuse, isn't it? We are all affected by gender-based violence and femicide. So she is also carrying a very big portfolio, which include also the issues of social uh, grants. So thank you very much, Minister, for the leadership, for the vision that you are carrying, and you know for the support that you always give to all of us. And lastly, I want to thank also communication, you know, for the sterling work that they are also doing. Thank you, and DG, thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, she gets the last word, so I'm not going to say anything else but to say thank you for being w uh, be part of this important session. It's lunchtime, uh, so lunch will be served downstairs um, uh, in the open, so you are free to find somebody you didn't come here with and go and have lunch with them and engage with them about how you're going to rate me for the work that I've done today. So thank you very much. Uh, give yourselves a hand. Oh, sorry, they said I must wait. You've got the message? Okay, let's listen to the message. It's very short, Marcelo's message. Honorable Minister of Social Development, Linda V. Zulu, government and civil society representatives, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great pleasure to extend the greetings of the International Social Security Association and its membership in 106 free countries on the occasion of this intersectoral seminar. I wish to sincerely congratulate the Department of Social Development on the launch today at the Nelson Mandela Foundation of a milestone report whose title is A Call for All of Us, Reducing Child Poverty. This report demonstrates the outstanding commitment of South Africa to extend social security coverage and alleviate child poverty, and it highlights the impressive progress that has been achieved. The Child Support Grant has no doubt been the main building block. The report shows how child poverty declined as its uptake increased between 2003 and 2013. In addition, the grant has also been a pillar of resilience, helping to protect children in times of economic shocks and the COVID-19 pandemic. The achievements of South Africa in reducing child poverty have been recognized at the global level. Importantly, the Department of Social Development recently won the ESA Good Prex Award for the extension and impact of the child support grant. South Africa is seen as a leader and the best practice in the global trend to use social security grants to promote inclusive, positive outcomes for poor children. The increasing number of policies that are put in place in different regions benefit from growing evidence of the effectiveness of such grants. They are also informed by key features of the South African approach including strong anti-poverty targeting, its broad reach, and its constitutional rights-based nature. The impact of such grants is much wider than short-term poverty reduction. They are transformational by improving nutrition, health, and educational outcomes. They help build the foundation for empowerment, inclusion, activity, and resilience during the entire life course. Ladies and gentlemen, I should like to recognize 
the readiness of the Department of Social Development, SASA, and the other South African stakeholders to share their experience with other countries, including at ESA events on many occasions. This event extends the positive impact of the child support grant beyond the borders of South Africa. To conclude, I believe that the launch of the report today will no doubt be instrumental for all stakeholders to redouble their efforts so we can achieve what the title of the report calls for, reducing child poverty. Thank you very much. Lunch is served. Have a wonderful afternoon.